tell you might excite me overnight. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get things started. I wanted to do a quick sound check for folks that are on the OWL system. Um, anybody online that's willing to either say, yeah, you can, I can hear you great, or yes. otherwise. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, well, welcome everybody to the second meeting of the Stakeholder Advisory Group to study provision of broadband service to the development. Um, this, is, this is not going to be a formal meeting meant to be a discussion, and uh, we're going to do limited staff talking, present ideas, present consensus recommendations that we formed, uh, and then turn it over to the group to hear from what you guys have to say. Um, but to go through the first you know, few items of business, uh, we want to go uh, quickly through the welcome and introduction. Um, I've realized with a couple of folks walking into the room that throughout two years of virtual meetings, sometimes I don't recognize everybody immediately <laughs> upon arrival. Uh, so I think it would be beneficial. Well, remain to many break that. Right. <laughs> so I think it would be beneficial um, for the folks in the room first to go around briefly, um, do quick introductions, and then we can turn it over to the folks that are online to uh, unmute one by one. While we're doing that, I'll take roles. There's no secondary process behind that. Um, so let's start over here with Mr. James, and then we'll go around the horseshoe. Eldon James, and I'm representing the Virginia chapter of the American Planning Association. John Lee, and I'm representing the Electric Cooperatives as Employee Broadband. David Walker, Committee of Energy. I'm Jason Nicuestas from Albemarle County. Steve Sandy from Franklin County, representing Baker as well. Uh, Rob Taylor, representing the EBTIA, BBA, BBIA. Okay. Jeff Brown, I'm with the HCD and the State Building Codes Office. Uh, Mike Lockerbie, uh, I'm with William Waddell, Carolyn Lockerbie, and I'm here uh, for BML and for the Virginia Association of Telecommunications Officers. Good morning, everyone. Excuse me, Chris McDonald with BCTA, Broadband Association. And I'm Heidi Cook with Old Money Public Affairs here at Dominion Bank. Oh. <laughs> Tamara Hall, the director of the Office of Broadband. I'm like, I think I should call everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> we should all know you. <laughs> And I'm Chandler Vaughn, uh, also with the Office of Broadband as a policy analyst. I'm Grace Wheaton. I'm a policy analyst with our policy and legislative office at DHCD. Um, and we do have a person with the, the DHCD team here today, and I've asked him to do two things at once, so I apologize in advance. But Cole McAndrew just joined our office uh, with the Virginia Management Fellows Program. Um, Cole, hate to ask you to do two things at one time, but do you have a brief elevator pitch about uh, Virginia Management Fellows, what they are, what they do, who yeah, you are? Sure. Thanks, Chandler. Um, so I'm Cole McAndrew. Uh, Virginia Management Fellows is a uh, management fellowship program that places uh, recent college graduates into uh, state agencies in uh, eight month tours. Do we also have? That's up, Chandler. You do three eight month tours of different agencies uh, and sort of get a feel of what it's like to work in state government. And uh, my first one is at the HCD Office of Broadband. So, so yeah, we're happy to have Cole on with the, with the team. Uh, a lot of things going on over the next eight months, and Cole will be kind of the leading edge of that. So we're excited to have him on board, and we'll hear from him later too in terms of uh, presenting some of the draft potential recommendations um, from the advisory group. Um, so now for the folks that are online, I'll just go down my list. Uh, the first we have is Andrew Clark. Do you mind unmuting yourself, saying a quick introduction? Hey, yeah, good morning. Uh, Andrew Clark with the Home Builders Association of Virginia. And next up is Phil Abraham. Hi, uh, Phil Abraham with the Vector Corporation, uh, representative of Virginia Association of Commercial Real Estate. And I was interested to hear about your Commonwealth in uh, what was that name? It the Commonwealth Fellow Program. Good fellowship. Fellowship, because I uh, about forty three years ago, I was in a program called the Commonwealth Intern Program, where the governor's office picked like five or six people a year, and you got year long assignments. They actually paid you, and uh, here I am, still stuck in, involved in state government. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably the program you went through, right? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Anyways, very compelling. Uh, and we, we got to pick three state agencies of our choice, 
and one was the personnel and training, one was the Lieutenant Governor's Office where I first met Ben Dendy and Chuck Robb, and the third was the Office of Emergency and Energy Services. Anyway, enough, but it's interesting they have that back. Sounds like yeah, a really good program. Like, that's the same framework, it sounds like. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can connect over an email later just to, just to hear more about BMF 42 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, the uh, next person on the list, uh, I'm unsure if she was able to join, Amanda Cox. Amanda, are you on? I, I don't see her. All right, and then uh, we'll, we'll loop her in later if she's able to join. Uh, we also know Rosemary uh, Mahan was not also was not able to join us as well today. So that rounds out introductions. Uh, really quickly, I must say, I have to toot our own horn. There is a former Virginia Management Fellow. I don't know if that's a good thing. No, <laughs> no. We, we have three folks that have gone through fellowships on the NFL fellowship. So Grace and Chandler Rules have been in two different fellowship programs um, at the state, and then Cole's in the current one. So DHCD has been blessed to have folks that have gone through the fellowship programs at the state. So I just want to toot our own horn. Yeah, that's very kind of you to say, well, see, we're here 42 years later, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I won't used to be able to see that. But, yeah. um, just, just, we also had Amanda just jump on the line. So Amanda, we just finished up introductions, so great timing. Um, can you just unmute, quickly say who you are, organization? Sure. Amanda Cox with Appalachian Power. Um, I have worked a lot of the utility leverage rural broadband projects in Virginia. Thanks, Amanda and Chandler. I think Ray's on as well. Oh, and yes, I was reminded, um, Ray Lamura. Ray, are you on? Ray Lamura, VCTA, the Broadband Association of Virginia. Thanks, Claire. I'm under trust. Yeah. So going on to the next slide, we've done that. Um, quick review of the agenda. Um, this is, you know, flexible by all means, but we first want to do a review of Jan June 6th meeting um, then we're going to go into draft recommendations. We'll, as DHCD staff, go down the list um, consistent with what the handout Cole just sent out was as well to the folks that are online. Same order as that list of draft potential recommendations from the stakeholder advisory group. Uh, we'll have a break after that. That break might coincide with lunch. We'll just see what the will of the group is at that point. Lunch should be here by then. Um, then we'll go back through the list for a discussion of draft recommendations. The intent behind that is we don't want this draft list of potential recommendations to seem like an either or setup. I think there, there's some things in there um, based on the discussion today that could be looked at as complementary, where you know two or more things are, are brought to the table or recommended to this advisory group. We don't want it to be seen as a as a one by one. That's why we'll go through the whole way and then go back and, and redo it again and talk talk through them as we go. Um, working lunch, which could roll anywhere in the agenda. And then we'll have a public comment period um, for any folks that may join us later in person or might be online and talk about where we go from here. <coughs> so with that, I can turn it over to Grace. Yes, for okay. sure. Thank you. Much appreciated. So by the way, for those who are at home, we'll try and remember to speak up for you all because I know sometimes our owl can pick up or sometimes it can. So just halt, like put something in the chat or holler at us if you can't hear us at all. I know it can be very annoying being on the other side of the meeting and just be like, why can't we hear anyone in the room? But to quickly review what we've done up to this point. So again, the purpose of this stakeholder advisory group, and I think we've said this about 50 times at this point, is we have to review how best to and how to facilitate the implementation of broadband and new development. And our bill, again, specifically asked us to do three very clear things, which is, again, our three shelves. So one, our group needs to compile information on existing ordinances and what's out there. We need to make recommendations about existing local ordinances and policies and procedures that have been effective. And then we need to identify consensus recommendations to existing state law and presumably policy that would facilitate the point of broadband into new residential commercial development. So between like, and we spent much of the first meeting going over that charge, getting a sense of what we needed to do, and identifying the problems that lay in front of us when it comes to implementing broadband into this new residential commercial development. From that insight that we gained from the first meeting, we had some additional sidebar conversations with members about what 
just to gain a little bit more clarity about what may be needed and what is recommended. And from those conversations and that insight and the background research we have done, we have developed and we've produced our draft recommendations, which, and Chandler will go, we'll start that discussion here. We, yes, there we go. So that's our, those are our charges for the people at home. And then very familiar, we are at our second meeting, right? And just as a quick reminder, again, we're gonna have our final meeting on September 1st. The report is presented and due to the BAC on September 30th. And we'll go over this timeline a little bit more later, but we're hoping to, after this second meeting, have a sense of what recommendations we want to bring forward so as we as staff can start drafting this report and have it all to you before that final meeting. And again, using the insight that we gained from our conversations and from that first meeting and from a lot of the research that we've done, we've developed these draft recommendations. And I would just emphasize that again, these are draft. There are a menu of options. Feel free to pick none, some, or all of them. We'll go over them. What we intend to do is go through all the recommendations, provide some context, and then circle back to them one by one for discussion. So we'll go through all of them, and then we'll have a break. Maybe the lunch is there at this, that point, and then we'll go and um, discuss them again one by one. Also, for we have had it added at the end a slide for other recommendations. So if you have an idea that wasn't necessarily on that list that you would like to bring up, we will have time to propose those ideas and have that discussion. But that would be at the end of all of these things. So with that, I think Chandler, if we're good, let's start going through our recommendations and then we'll see where we go from there. Sure. Yeah. I'll take the clicker back. Makes sense. Um, one of the things we heard in individual conversations after June 6th, before this meeting, um, was the primary pinch point was cost responsibility. You know, so if there was ever a requirement, um, as the original bill introduced, there was ever a requirement that broadband service be provided to new development at the time of construction, you know, whose responsibility was it going to be to pay for that cost? Um, so we, we heard that, you know, essentially almost as a non-starter in the ways of, you know, assigning cost responsibility. So I think you're going to see that a lot of the recommendations, at least the suite of recommendations we're offering, um, are to promote coordination between the entities in the development process that would help broadband be ready uh, to be deployed or be deployed at the time of construction. So that, that's, that's what frame we're coming at this from. But, you know, don't interpret that to mean that another potential recommendation can't be brought up by the stakeholder advisory group during this meeting. Uh, this is just a, a list of options. Things can be brought up. Things um, absolutely should be uh, critiqued as we go along. If, there, if there's any questions as we go through this explanation process, cut us off. Let us know. We, we want to do potentially as much as we can. We want to do all the explaining through this first run through. Uh, and then we can go through the second one and hear the input from the group. So the first recommendation, um, and we've categorized these, right? We've categorized them by the potential action that it would require, um, as well as just the overall topic subject area. The first one here, the action would, would be legislative action, um, with the topic area being adopt a Dig Once policy, modified Dig Once policy under the op optional subdivision ordinance. Um, and the text on the PowerPoint slide here is exactly what we have in person, but essentially what this goes after um, is passing legislation that would assign the responsibility to the lead developer to notify groups um, through a common platform that a trench will be open or is currently open that would allow somebody else the opportunity to drop fiber, water sewer pipes, um, natural gas even in that trench as that, as that development process is happening. Um, with the ability to potentially cost share the responsibility there after that trench has already been dug or is in the process of being dug. Um, our, our initial thought here is that uh, platform would be maintained by VDOT. Um, and I, I want to emphasize here that you know, the scope of what this Dig Once policy is in the draft recommendation, the intent behind it, the HCD, um, you know, we're only looking here within the subdivision ordinance, right? We're, we're not we're not trying to make a statewide swing here at, at a, what, a, what a potential Dig Once policy is. There's a lot of examples across the country of what a what a what a universal Dig Once policy would be. Um, we're specifically looking into the subdivision or the optional subdivision ordinance here, to where if a local government wanted to take on the responsibility of notifying groups, 
that a trench would be open and require that notification from developers, they would have the opportunity to pass that kind of uh, ordinance in their optional subdivision ordinance at that local government level. Uh, questions? Chandler? Chandler? Go this, ahead. this is Phil. Um, the slide doesn't, you mentioned residential, but it doesn't appear limited to residential. It appears to all development. I correct in that the way this is drafted? So I, I'll, I guess I can clarify the intent of it wasn't to be uh, all development. Okay, that helps because in the commercial yeah. side, there'd be some, you know, I think some significant concerns possibly with something like this to put the onus on the developer. Sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that uh, that, that that was a good that, that was a good clarification point. But um, yeah, the, the intent of this right now from DHD's point, which can be edited in any way by this group, uh, was just under the subdivision ordinance, prior, which okay. would primarily be residential. Chandler, if I can just put in with one thing, I think we're forgetting the the importance of VDOT in this particular situation. Um, larger cities and larger towns would, by necessity, know, but counties and smaller towns, they oftentimes don't know that a trench is open because VDOT is doing the permitting and inspections. So, or if there's a private road, they don't know about it. So those are those are issues, and and so the people who actually have the the road open would need to be involved, or again, be not which would yeah. be doing. No, that's helpful. I'm trying. Chamber, <clears throat> um, talk a little bit more about administration of this. You talk about be not, but then you say within the subdivision, and that's the subdivision ordinance is administered locally, and. Be that's so a good same thing in the counties. No, that's a good point, and I, I think it would help too to clarify from the jump that I mean all, all the details aren't you know spelled out in this proposal for a reason, uh, so we can hear you know what the thoughts are when we go back and actually write the final report. Uh, but no, you bring up a good point, and I, I think that, that the flexibility there would be you know would this be administered by the local government or would it be uh, administered by VDOT? You're right to point out that. You know, of course, VDOT may not have a role in that process locally. Um, something we can consider when drafting up the final report. Chandler, this is Ray Lemura. Um, there's one other issue I see in here, and this is something I know Michelle Gowdy and I have talked about for years, but each locality has different requirements for public notice. So you're going to have a cornucopia of different timelines related to this as well. Understood. So Ray, this is Tamara. Are they not all following just the traditional public notice requirements? Yeah, localities follow what's in the state code. Okay. Because I thought I, I mean I come from I worked in Jessica County for a very long time. They do so. additional notifications, okay. right? But they, they must follow what's in the state okay. code. At the but minimum. For different kinds of notices the code is different. Okay. <laughs> and there okay. are, I can't even tell you how many different notices. Okay. Is there a work group about that now? Pardon me? There's a work group about the public notices. Yes, there, yes, is. there is absolutely <laughs> reviewing those. I'm not on that one. No, but some of our staff of the CLT does. So they are reviewing those, but do we note that there are okay. 50 million different ways and requirements that localities have to say for holding a meeting? Okay. So, Another issue, final issue that I would point out is, again, it's, um, as Eldon pointed out, the, the subdivision ordinance is not necessarily where you would put that sort of a permitting. You might put it more properly, I would say, in terms of franchising, but franchising, of course, is optional and uh, very individually tailored. So that would put it more in the range of probably somewhere in Title 56. Code rather than 15.2. Sorry for dorking out on the legal stuff. <laughs> no, we need no, it. We need, we'll need that eventually. So, um, Bill, you have a hand raised, and then I, I'm going to say one more thing. I think we'll move on and, and rebat this in the second portion. But, Bill, go ahead. Yes, having already been clarified that this is um, residential, of course, 
my members do a lot of mixed use development. So we remain interested uh, with Andrew and in, in the impact of putting this burden on the developer. Um, one thing I will say is we're spending an inordinate amount of time dealing with stormwater requirements right now. And you would, um, the time a trench would have to be remain open could create stormwater runoff issues and all that kind of stuff. So I think that has to be worked into the discussion too. How long would this trench have to remain open and the developers, the one who is subject to uh, violations and uh, DEQ showing up on their door if there is a stormwater event? Okay, well, let me go ahead and fire the first shot over the bow. Um, it's a rare occasion. And that I'm putting on my electric utility app now when we leave a trench open at any time, uh, overnight, especially because of liability concern with um, trenching in electric conductor is a lot different than, than slicing up the ground and laying a piece of fiber down there. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to um, endorse a natural gas line being laid right beside electric conductor. I don't think any of us want to do that. Uh, but this one, this one's going to be a tough one for the electric utilities to swallow. Uh, in addition to that, if if my crews are out there in the middle of the night, at two o'clock in the morning, we got somebody who doesn't have power, and we're digging up a line. I don't want to have to be concerned about cutting Verizon's line or anything else. If it's mine and it's down there, then I have to sure. accept responsibility for mine. Uh, but my guys. When they're out there in the middle of the night and are driving rain or snowstorm trying to get somebody's lights back on, that's the only one objective they have at that time. So, you know, th this is going to be a little bit of a hard pill for the co ops to swallow. I don't know where Dominion is on it, but I'll tell you that's where we are. Definitely a safety concern. But I'm trying to connect it. Maybe I'm missing something here. You know, some of these areas that I believe what's happening and trying to ensure broadband services and more unserved areas today where a development takes place compared to an area where there's access at the front of a subdivision to, to go in and build. And, and that for Dominion, we have joint joint use partnerships with individuals to do joint trenching. Uh, so is it really about you know, the neighborhood, it's sort of the community, the subdivision itself, or more the infrastructure that needs to be in place you know, to actually allow that connection in the subdivision? I may be missing something. I want to you can't just build the fiber in the subdivision. You know, you have to have backhaul. You got to be able to connect sure. it somewhere. So where is that? Sure, sure. No, and I think this is something that we, we, we tried to splice out during the first meeting. Uh, but you know, th this scenario would apply to, you know, in a well urbanized county, let's say you're operating on the edges of Charlottesville, right? right? You know, there's already mainline fiber cable on the road in front of a development. Um, Maybe now, under the current operations, there's a delay between the time that cable is run off the main line to homes based on when those homes are actually occupied because there's not a density, there's not enough of a density drive to deploy that cable or fiber. Um, this potential dig once opportunity would have the ability for ISPs through a cost share agreement, maybe with an electric provider, to for, be further incentivized to deploy cable or fiber on the front end of development rather than waiting until. Uh, waiting until you know, the population density demands it. Could yep. I just, sorry, can I just jump in? Philip has been, um, or Andrew, sorry, Andrew's been waiting pretty patiently for a chance. So Andrew, I see your hand raised. Do you want to say something? Oh, no, Grace, go ahead. Uh, my question or comment was just generally about the administration of it, specifically the public notice piece. And I forget who was speaking before, but, you know, would that public notice be required to be sent out, posted, and no work could kind of commence until that notice closed. But I, a few of the folks kind of hit on that point. So go ahead, Grace. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Um, so I, I think part of the uh, part of the impetus for, for bringing this up, and I was the one that brought this to the table last meeting, um, is the fact that while we've been talking about uh, getting unserved locations and making sure that unserved locations are addressed, uh, that is a, a runway that's ending, right? Like we, we are getting to that point. Um, and so I think that a valuable thing to consider is what do we do after that? Um, and I think one of the, the, the emphasis for a program like this is lowering the cost of a project in, in a overbuilt situation. Um, and for us, encouraging overbuilding increases competition. That's not something that necessarily everybody 
at the table want. Um, but it's something that's important for us to make sure that our residents are getting the best opportunity um, at, at the best cost. And so um, a project like we have, well, I'll just throw in my neighborhood where uh, we started with uh, two incumbent providers who at the time of uh, development, they had the opportunity to lay down conduit and put in their service. Um, and then two additional providers wanted access, um, they were granted access. And so for about a year and a half, everybody's yards was just ripped up. Um, roads were ripped up. And so um, avoiding that and avoiding the cost um, has the potential to increase uh, competitiveness, especially in lower income or uh, more urbanized developments where the cost for trenching, ripping up the roads is gonna be significantly more expensive. I can say anecdotally, I have a project where I'm representing the owner doing a pretty significant uh, dark fiber build. And by reaching out in a targeted way to people who we thought might be interested in doing co-build various utilities, uh, we've been able to cut our costs 25 or 30% for those co-build areas. And that could be significant for uh, developments that are kind of on the edge of whether it makes economic sense to do that build. Steve? One thought <clears throat> versus the, the localities required to do those, would there be any um, opportunities to use Virginia 811 for this? Because they're all of these people are already part of that organization, and I think there probably should be some sort of notification process through Virginia 811 to say, hey, we've got this open trench or this opportunity here. Um, I'm just thinking that might be a better way to kind of get the word out sure. to people that the opportunity is there. Um, just throw that out as a thought. It's a good point. I, I don't want to get bogged down specifically in this one before we, before we you know, swing through them again. Uh, last thought. For those who would be installing the fiber, how much advance notice do you need to know there's going to be an open trench? It's not like, hey, we're opening the trench tomorrow and they're going, oh, great, we're there. No, it doesn't work like well, for us, right, it's a so beat. We just can't just snatch a right. off a project and go, go ahead. How much advance notice would you reasonably need? I'd say for us, it'd be a, a minimum of 30 days. You got to think, too, many providers are planning their builds years out, right? right? Their investments. So it could be a long time. You know, if they're not going to be in the right area, if they're planning for a different town at the time, and they're not planning over here, they're not going to be able to go in because they don't have the funds set aside for that build. And basically, if you don't bring the ISP in, the developer doesn't bring the ISP in ahead of time to explain to them their build plan, then he might not even have the right fiber he needs, right? It depends on how the development is going to be laid out, how many homes you're going to be passing and everything else. Again, I, I always think of if, if you have a developer who is building a residential, a new residential area, and they're not talking to utilities and ISPs, they're not, then they're not planning on selling their lots anytime soon. I don't know if anybody who's going to go out and buy a home now that doesn't have internet access or early fiber internet access. So to me, it, it goes back onto the developers. If they want to sell those lots, they're going to have to coordinate this. And it, it needs to be coordinated. And that's what we're doing now with a lot of developers. If they're bringing us in on their planning stages to say, what is it going to cost for me to do this? I, that's what I was actually getting ready to ask that during the site plan review process at the local level is that coordinate. I mean, I've come from Chesterfield. I don't know what happened on the, on the broadband side. I know that there was barely coordination within so they created a unified process. So I was just curious, I was actually thinking about that. Is it better around the site plan review? Of course, it could be 20 years before development actually gets built. Yeah, but Let's you're gonna see. you're gonna put one size fiber in for a development that is gonna start off with 100 homes and possibly go to 500 homes versus right. a development that's only gonna be capped at 100 homes. Yeah, it, it is important also to <laughs> BML that that not be uh, not be mandated in part because site plans are not mandated. Right. There are plenty of localities that don't require site plans for vast swaths of development. All right, so put that in the parking lot. All helpful points. Yeah. Um,
We'll revisit this again. Phil, I in the chat. Phil, I appreciate you raising your hand. We're gonna move on. <laughs> this is a technical thing. Just to be very helpful for those of you in person. I apologize for not being there. If people could identify who's talking, because it's really hard for us video to know who it is who's talking. Sure. Thank you. That would we we'll, we can absolutely do that. Our apologies. Makes sense. Uh, the, the next next section is a different category, right? Still legislative action, but um, not per se a dig once policy, but adopting coordination uh, policies across these different uh, groups involved. Uh, here is something where you know, not necessarily an opportunity to go through the whole dig once policy of bringing everybody in, um, but you know, the ability uh, to notify internet service providers that trenches will be open uh, in the development process. So, you know, again, just for the for the sake of a disclaimer at the set the front, uh, these bullets of the these bullets listed are likely going to be imperfect from the start. So that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here to hone in on them. Uh, so the, the first idea: require local governments to notify ISPs, developers, that trenches will be open um, during the installation of public utilities, water, sewer, for example. Um, and then this is paired too with a secondary option of being able to authorize local governments to do that um, in the event they have the capacity to undertake that kind of effort they do um, but it would certainly not be a requirement of local governments to do so under that second bullet there um, so any any clarifying questions on this one i, I think would, it goes back. i would suggest that you start with the authorize and and this is elvin james um, that you start with the authorized rather than the require, um, with the understanding that we all know the General Assembly meets every year, and if you needed to pump it up later, you, you'd have some experience to go by. If, and, and one advantage to that is local governments watch what other local governments do. And if you authorize and somebody figures out a good way to do it that makes sense for the development community, it makes sense for coordination with other utilities, it becomes the example that others can follow. Success breeds success. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you have a hand raised? Um, yeah, it's kind of more of a question for look. What is there anything prohibiting them from notifying an ISP now? I know. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not aware of anything. Um, hey. When I read this, I thought, gosh, I think we could already do this. Yeah, in fact, our planning office is working with us in our comp plan process to sort of figure out um, ways that we can opportunistically create these opportunities. That was redundant. That was Jason from uh, Almaro. Yeah, this authorized. Yeah, I feel like there's a good number of localities that are kind of doing this as part of the comp plan process, or like small area plans and things like that. Kind of just general kind of setting up the area for for future economic development. So, yeah. No, I guess our thinking on this one, this, there was a bill, uh, 2021 session maybe, um, seemed like it was authorizing something that was already obvious, school boards being able to promote the provision of low cost service plans from broadband providers. But I think it was just a matter of it being, because some school boards are already doing that, uh, and others didn't feel comfortable because it wasn't explicitly authorized. So, I mean, yeah, I, that, that's a good point of clarification that you know, this is already possible. Um, but if there's any clear path built for local governments to do it, maybe it's beneficial uh, to go down this road. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is great. Um, I, I don't see that there's a need for legislation to do this. I mean, when every time, anytime you put in legislation, it opens it up for mischief. And, you know, <laughs> there was. It is just, I think, you know, VML and VACO and we are all working together to improve and enhance communication. And I just don't think that this, uh, uh, this bullet point is necessary. I'm gonna, gonna take Ray's comment one step further, you know, notwithstanding everything I said a minute ago, this is Elvin James. Uh, if you do put in legislation to authorize and it's defeated, that means that those who were doing it under what they thought was their, their existing broad police powers uh, got stopped. Good point. 
this is Mike Lockby. I can make a very strong argument that they don't, but you got a better argument that they do. Yeah. I guess the bigger point here would be is if the local governments are installing conduit, is are they requiring that the internet service provider use that? Okay. And can they require that? I you know think it's I mean? an excellent. Rather than yeah. Yeah, it's River Street <laughs> coming in and saying, well, we don't like your conduit, uh -huh. we don't our own conduit. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that'll be the discussion point on the next one, too. Yeah. yeah. I think we, I think localities can do it if they want. I think, I think we, we have that ability, but the question in my mind would be can I make you go in that conduit? And that's where we've had the issues is certain companies don't, they want to do it their own way and they don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, they, they have their own way of doing it and their own materials and, you know, all that, which makes sense. Um, but it just means it makes it hard for a dig once policy when everybody has to dig their own way, put their own thing in. Any other thoughts? On yeah, this one? Seems, yeah, this is David. It seems uh, just reading this and a little bit detached from this, it seems like the, the second bullet is more beneficial in the overall landscape of what's trying to be achieved compared to, I go back to what Heidi and others said, if somebody provides notice to River Street about, hey, we got an open trench over here. It's not like, I don't believe you guys are just sitting where I would be sitting around waiting to say, right. well, let me just run by this neighborhood and put some fiber in. I mean, that's just not the way it works. So the value could be, yeah, if you had excess conduit, it could be leveraged there. It does seem to be a benefit there, but in terms of notification, I just don't think they can set it to John. It's not, it's not the way the processes work, unfortunately. Well, don't forget to one of the John Lee with the co-ops. One of the problems that we faced when we've done both uh, put fiber in in anticipation of growth um, alongside our, our electric ductor in the ground is that most of the time people don't want the access into their home at the same place where their meter box is. So, you know, you can open the yard up again. I mean, my house is a great example. So mine comes in right where my meter box is, but you know we wanted the router in our office, so we had to go back around the house and trench in anyway to get to that to get to that place. So I mean it's it's still a challenge, you know. Even it, it's not that you're not going to have to go back in and, and probably throw a trench down to get to where they want it to come into their homes either. So it's 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 the challenge doesn't end there. Sure. So. Okay. This is Mike Lockby. This this bleeds into the next two topics as well, but this authorizing local governments to install conduit, that might actually be useful insofar as currently public service authorities have express authority to do that. And some of them do. Um, they lay three channel conduit and maybe they put their own 12 strands through it, but then they have two more open channels. Local governments, many of whom operate their own utility, don't have similar authorization. I think some of them do it under general police power, but it'd be nice if it was put somewhere that it was clear that they could, in the same way it was for public service departments. Sure. So, I mean, just to explain the next point, it sounds like it's a good time to transition. Um, authorizing local governments, the ability to install conduit, um, be able to lease or give yeah, that conduit. Uh, to an internet service provider in exchange for you know, incentivizing a service be made available on day one of a, of a you know, potential move in a new development. Thoughts, questions, discussion? I know that, I know that I'll, I'll prompt this one. Uh, I know there's not a lot of uh, standards out. I mean, the standards between different ISPs vary greatly when you're talking about conduit, right? You know, the, ISPA might want um, four inch, ISPB might want three inch, but then four channels within the three inch conduit. So it's just, uh, I think there's a lot of complexity around that item to unpack, but uh, general thoughts here on, on this idea. This is Mike Lock. The, uh, as to point number one, that would be very nice to have. As to point number two, that's already mostly mandated for comprehensive plans. So it's, it's it already exists. So, Mike, are you talking about the second bullet in the third subject? List? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Well, I think we'll be on that one in a moment, right? I think. Oh, I think you're, you're talking about comp plans, right? So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm going to. We're going to. We'll, we'll go through that yeah. One. <laughs> okay. Well. Sorry. Let me jump. 
so we, we can revisit this one later on as well. I'm, I'll, Actually, pass, you wanted, yeah, I'll take it. pass it over to Grace for the next one. All righty. So, so, okay, you're going off the first one. We can stay on this one if you want to. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of the same comment, and I kind of like to hear discussion from some of the folks that, that put fiber in. Is if local governments did this, would you even use it? I think it's, it's really the question. Because I think we would, uh, Franklin County, and I think other counties across the state would probably consider it as an incentive to, to development, but if nobody's going to use it, what's the point? And so, yeah, that would just be my thing. Would it be better to have a financial aid? You guys put it in. Here's some some dollars to do it versus versus us put the cost. Name and organization. Steve Sandy, Franklin County. Right. Okay. It's all right. Just just for people online. Right. Yeah, so this is Rob Taylor with the uh, TIA, also for Tony Networks. And, we, and we're an ISP. And we we you know, like to bury our fiber. And, you know, first thought is you can't look to get towards the mouse, right? There's there's cost there for the fiber. In. Now, if you do it properly, then sure we want to use it. Do it improperly doesn't do as much good. So it all goes back to the coordination, right? If you're going to say, hey, we have this development and here are the plans, and you were to bring us and or other ISPs in to say, if we were to put the conduit in, how should we do it? And you and you do it in, in the way that we would be willing to install our fiber in. And if you you sleep it so that multiple fibers could go into it, then, then you would also get the the ability to where you'd have multiple sliders. I mean that could, that could be an opportunity there. Um, but if you just put the conduit in and, and you think, well, we just ran all this conduit in, but you don't have handholds in the right locations, you don't have pestles in the right locations, you don't have design properly, it probably won't do as much good. But it's going to be really hard to design it for multiple users. Well, I would think multiple, I would think most users would use the same way, uh, use the same type of configuration, but yeah, then you get into your handholds. Your handholds are going to be different Right, spots. yeah. Then you get into the fact, well, I really don't want my handhold to be in the same location. These guys have their handhold because now I have to open the handhold, work on my fibers, and if I damage his fibers, you know, exactly, you know, so it does. It, I mean, it gets very convoluted very quickly, but uh, in an effort to encourage development, having the pathway there is, is half the battle. I mean, then you get away from the fact where you've got an existing development, and somebody has to come in, tear the roads up, tear it up. The, the, Sidewalks and everything to put a new fiber in. Um, Jason from Almaro County. Um, on that, and, and to stray a little bit um, off the development question, but if the same uh, channel conduit was running along uh, a main road uh, or a secondary road, especially in, uh, in rural areas, would there be additional incentive there to? Utilize those conduits for um, robbing expansion. To, to, or to say to overbuild an existing. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know because there. Then you start the business case, right? Because even though you have that interduct there, and it's a lot easier for me to fiber it after the fact, there's still the cost of the fiber, and there's still the cost of the electronics, and I need a certain penetration amount to cover those costs to even make. And so that's why when you take a look at it, when you get into rural parts of the state and you're only passing five to ten homes per mile, it's hard enough for me to make a business case if I'm, I'm getting 40 or 60. Ten homes per mile, we'd take that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, but you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. you see what I mean? So, uh, I mean, I, there's, yeah, it, I don't think the business case is there if it's very rural, that you, even if you have the empty, in, an empty interduct. For somebody to want to come in and overbuild the existing fiber network because even even at a really good tape rate there's not going to be enough customers there to come in. well as a dovetail on your points too rob this john lee from the electric co-ops the design and engineering because it still goes back to handle look it's it's a little more complex than just throwing it in the ground and, oh yeah yeah, yeah. opening the ground up and do a splice it's it's a lot to it uh, and i think the design is, is a well, it's the first piece right um, you know, for us, I think we, we'd have a hard time answering that question until we knew what it was and what else was going to be in there and everything else. Because for me, when we put fiber in, I want to be able to provide the same kind of reliability I do on the electric side. So, you know, all those things have to go in the, into the decision. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to my original 
statement about this whole effort, I, I think it's incredibly premature. This state is, is under a, a very aggressive program to build out the Commonwealth. And I, I'm proud to say, I think we're gonna be one of the first states to do that and have everybody with access. Um, so, you know, for us down where we are, we're there, we're gonna, we're gonna serve it. We're gonna build it in there. It's not even a question. We want it. Like I said to Rob, to Rob's point, we're, our density is seven customers per mile, okay? Seven members per mile. I think Dominion's is 54, something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're gonna serve. We got the facility there. We want the customers. We want them to be connected. We want to serve. Would Ray has more hand raised? Oh, sorry. Yeah, first, I agree with everything uh, John Lee just said. Secondly, I'm very concerned about any type of blanket authorization for localities not to step on the toes of my local government friends. But those that are engaged in, in broadband activity have already created an authority and they can you know, perform the activity this way. But to, to grant such a sweeping uh, authorization for local governments, uh, I'd be opposed to that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't know, Rob could probably speak to it, maybe for the, the back to the condo pieces of just ensuring, it'd be nice to know if you do road crossings for a couple. But then the rest, I mean, I'm not even sure if pulling conduit through an existing, pulling fiber to a conduit is even any cheaper than just cutting the ground open and laying it in for you guys. I mean, the value is not just yeah, pouring under roads and things like I mean, that. Having the interduct there, it is a little bit cheaper than, but you still have the cost to pull the Pull yeah, in, right. Pull it through the interduct. Yeah, yeah. There's still labor there. Yes. I tell you what, if you if you can get it across a railroad crossing, we'd be glad to use it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That'd be where it goes. This is my clock. To Mr. Lemire's point, I think that that to a degree, many localities have created those authorities due to the sketchiness of their authority to do some basic stuff like laying conduits themselves, and the proliferation of those authorities might be prevented by them having clear authority to do so. So Steve Sandy from Vaco and Franklin County. So this is you know we're kind of getting to the essence of the problem here for us is that really when and how to get the locality, the developer and the internet providers talking sooner in the process. <laughs> That's that's really the, the issue, and and the other issue is is the economic viability of those ISPs to, to come into those developments, uh, and at what point do they come into those developments? That's to me that's really the crux of, of the matter because even if I put conduit in, he's only coming into the subdivision when it makes sense for him to come into the subdivision and provide that service, um, and putting the conduit in may or may not give him that benefit or that incentive to, to do that. I have no way to, to, to make any of them do it. Um, it. One of the concerns I have too is like, you know, I can work with, with River Street and we can develop conduit that works for them. And, and maybe we put it in, I don't know about procurement and, and all of that from the local side of, of how I do that. Um, you know, and work with them and put it in and do it and everything. And then in our county, Chantel may say, well, why didn't you talk to us? We wanted to go in there too. Um, but we won't we won't use that conduit because that's not the way we would do it. And um, I don't know, I guess that's why we have this group because <laughs> I've, been, I've, I've struggled with it for years of how, how do we make this work and how do we better coordinate uh, with or without legislation? How do we better coordinate these activities and, can make it happen. So I, um, Rob Taylor with the uh, BTIA, and just excuse my ignorance here, but right now, if you have somebody developing a residential development, they've got to come up with plans. They get approved by the county, right? Right. Now I know on this group we have residential realtors and developers, and I'd like to know from them: Are there any of them going out now developing? new developments that haven't considered broadband as part of their infrastructure design? And if they are, do they have plans to even sell those lots in the future? I mean, because what I'm what I'm seeing is 
we have developers reaching out to us, asking us for quotes to help them design a broadband infrastructure in their new development. And we're giving them a price to say, this is what it would cost. And this is what we're willing to share. And this is what we're willing to do to start lining up these customers day one, but have the equipment to have these customers lit up 10 years from now when you're fully developed. So again, it gets back to the part, if, if I'm a developer and I'm in this to do a, to, re, to do a profit, I can't understand why in today's time I wouldn't be already reaching out to ISPs to get a price for them, just like I did to the utilities to get their cost or from somebody else. So, a Andrew, do you want to take that first and Phil? And then Ray, we also see that our hand is raised too. Yeah, was the question, um, it was cutting in and out, but was the question, are developers uh, passing on broadband essentially? I mean, are you guys aren't you guys already planning that in your development plans nowadays? Yeah, I mean, I, it, yeah, I mean, I was able to find maybe a handful of builders slash developers that you know are doing projects where there's no broadband, but th those are small small subdivisions under ten, and they're like you know twenty acre lots, but the folks who have done a project in the past who didn't have broadband, they couldn't give away the houses. I mean, it's almost a, you know, it's almost as essential as, you know, having the, having a road to get to the house. So that's maybe a simple answer, but it, it was really tough. And even, even in Southwest and some really rural areas, I mean, it's just kind of a fact of life. Um, so yeah, I think, as I mentioned last meeting, my members are in Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, and the Richmond area, so it's definitely a non-issue in our projects. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, just for informational purposes, um, VDOT was mentioned in one of the earlier points, and um, I represent a lot of highway contractors, and VDOT had a work group that Marty Williams headed up on coordination of underground utility work with VDOT, which was a huge issue and still is in getting people coordinated. I think it'd be good for the DHCD people to talk, if they haven't already, to the people who are working on that work group and how some of this might, some of that work might be used constructively, um, administratively or whatever for the local governments, because, uh, they spent a decent amount of time on that issue. If you have any uh, literature on that, points of contact, send them over if you have any follow up. Uh, Andrew, you have your hand raised, and then I want to give uh, Tamara an opportunity as well. Yeah, I was going to just see if, if DHCD or anybody's tried to quantify, you know, especially on the new construction side, um, you know, the extent of the issue. I mean, are there, is there, you know, a lot of subdivision, residential subdivisions going in that that aren't broadband, ready for broadband. You know, so I think that, you know, the U.S., the, the census every year publishes this characteristics of new housing and new developments, whatever they call it, and they break it down by, you know, who's got water, who's got sewer, I mean, get down to square footage of the lot. You know, every bell and whistle you can think of, I don't know if they include kind of broadband, um, uh, capacity on there, but I, I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way we can, you know, uh, figure out whether there's a uh, really an issue that we're looking at, or you know, this is kind of just, you know, it's just slowly happening. So, in terms of analyzing to the extent of you know, what new development doesn't have broadband service, I mean, we can't because of a lot of reasons, the proprietariness of service territory data. Uh, active build out maps we don't have access to. We, we don't have good estimations based on you know how much new development is going in without broadband service available on day one. Uh, we can look into that in terms of census data that opens up a different can of worms. Uh, but I'm mean, happy to go back and do more analysis there. But uh, I, th I think that the, uh, the idea behind this would be you know, to the extent we can encouraging the broadband service be available on day one. Uh, Tamara, did you want to? Yeah, Not two right things. Um, one, VDOT is hiring a broadband coordinator. So we had a call with the leadership at VDOT last Friday. And so one of the things is actually if you're participating in a 
and a 2022 body project, you'll be getting some emails from Tammy and the team just because we're trying to help VDOT expedite the permitting process as y'all are submitting the permits because they don't know what's a body versus not a body. And so we had a car and we've actually sent over shape files of all the body projects in relation to the VDOT administrative office. So we're, we're one, there's an infrastructure task force that we've been um, tasked to lead around broadband. And so we've been in conversation with Deputy Secretary DC and now coordinating with VDOT. So there's going to be more coordination between our agency and VDOT moving forward. And so thank you for sharing about the work group. Um, the, the, with Marnie Williams with VDOT, so I'll check into that. And then the other thing was, I'd be curious, and maybe we have to pull all tomorrow and, and Franklin for maybe one of y'all's projects. I'd be curious because one of the things that came up when the new administration took office, we had a broadband briefing, and they were like, "Well, are you technically subsidizing?" And I'm using air quotes for those of you you are not in the room. Um, new developments, right? And so one of the things we might want to do is do a couple of case studies and pull with the body projects that are now being built out and then what's already on the board for new developments because we are in essence through at least some of the main infrastructure we're building out while we might not go into an area where the housing is not physically there yet we are putting in some of the main infrastructure so it might be good for us to do some test cases maybe in one in each region that we're going to be building out body just to kind of see what's on the drawing board now having come from local government in Chuxville, i will tell you that i've had properties be zoned for 500 pound homes and then it gets rezoned and it's a it's a hundred it's gotten rezoned completely and then so the density that they put that we thought was going to be there is not there and it's 20 years for that to happen so i understand the, the a lot of times that what's originally proposed in a site plan could change and so trying to figure out how to put the infrastructure in may be a problem in terms of as evan used to say the math is not going to work right and so i want us to definitely maybe take a look back at least in the current since we are getting under contract you guys are in design and engineering for the body projects that were just awarded in December, maybe we go and look and see what's on the drawing board for some of these counties. Maybe you might be left that I have examples too of who you're working with and just see what's going on. Cause I mean, that's one of the questions we've gotten from the administration. So those are the couple of things I just wanted to point out about what we're at least the partnership with VDOT and we're having more communication. And then also curious about where the body investments are going. We are going by where there are new developments. We're also circling back the issue has been we've got places in here right on Chesterfield that don't have access and it's because they weren't built out with broadband in mind and so i think that's where the legis where, where this work comes from is we don't want that to happen again and so maybe it isn't happening again and we just don't know because there's not enough data i think it's let's move on to the next yes, point and then the after we get through this block maybe that's when we break for lunch yeah, maybe around noonish for everyone and for the folks at home, so we can try and get through these. But now, um, I guess to move on to a different set and block of recommendations, these are ways in which we can help or like facilitate broadband development through local government. And we had in mind legislation for this. Again, I think Chandler said it. None of these bullet points are perfect. Please feel free to change them. We are here to take ideas. So <laughs> can we move on to the first set of that. Um, so it is our understanding that there is no clear or specific authorization for local governments to use local resources to promote the extension of broadband networks into new developments. The closest that we could get was that language that Chandler referenced earlier that has to do with broadband services to like the school boards and for the purpose of education, which is not new development, right? Very two very different things. Um, also, without we were thinking when we wrote this that without the explicit authorization to do it, that it may hinder local governments from taking those steps. That said, again, I think there is, again, I think it was Mr. James who mentioned that if you try to do something through legislation, the General Assembly defeats it, what type of pickle are you in? So I accept that fact. But um, we are the recommendation here would be to give local governments the explicit authority by local option or whatever vehicle we think is best um, as a group to use their resources for the extension of broadband and new development. And so that would be, I, that's, pretty much the extent to the recommendation itself. Um, 
would solve it would I we think it would help solve maybe some of the coordinations and the ownership issue here. But I would be again, I will pause for thoughts here. And I see that Philip has his hand raised. So I'd be curious to see what he has to say first. Thank you. I guess I'm getting the feeling like maybe what's more in order is a best practices handbook of some sort rather than all this authorizing local government because I do think um, for those of us who uh, spend time in county cities and towns and send local government committees, localities have uh, very broad powers. Obviously cities have broader powers than counties, but counties still have pretty broad powers to do most of what we've talked about already. So maybe best practices recommendations for localities so they might not have thought of it, if that's true, might be okay, but I just don't think so far this one we need legislation authorizing this. That's just my thought. This was Mike Lockerbie. I, I think that that is probably 90% true. I agree with with that statement. However, the concern that local governments constantly have is that they are prohibited from having or promoting broadband. That puts them in the position of if they want to do some very basic stuff that's going to enable, such as putting in conduit, or um, putting in conduit, or or helping a broadband provider to, or even making grants. The State Corporation Commission, for what it's worth, thinks body is rather sketchy. So, um, it, because of some legislation that puts a lot of the body stuff, arguably, I don't. There's no law out there, but arguably into the purview of the State Corporation Commission. And thank you for holding them off. But I imagine you've done some work to hold them off. So. Um, having it be clear that at least some basic stuff as well as making of grants to uh, to private companies would be helpful uh, and it would probably head off a lot of localities that are very much not interested in having a wireless services authority and are on the fence from deciding to create one uh, and, and also i did want to note that if you create a wireless services authority as a local government and then provide them access to any of your conduit you open up that conduit to any private provider that subsequently wants to, which I think might allay some of the initial uh, 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 pain in the gut that I also have as a person who represents some owners of some private side owners of, of broadband on once in a while uh, about having the broadband authority there, but then just gobble up the local government's investment there before I had a chance at it. <clears throat> Uh, this is Ray, and uh, I'm sure you can appreciate. While I appreciate uh, Mr. Lockerbie's comments, I, I would disagree uh, with 90% of what he was saying as well. And again, I think uh, I'm a little concerned with the word promotion. I don't know what that means. It, it can be uh, very, very vast into helping to identify programs that exist with already existing program, pro, uh, broadband providers. Also, also, this is not identified to unserved areas. I think that's one thing we're missing a lot about. A lot of this is discussion is we need to be focused on unserved areas. And if you've got a Swiss cheese hole, then that's something to talk about with the local provider and the local government and the developer. But uh, this is, uh, I'll be opposed to this uh, bullet point as well. Certainly understand the, again, none of these are preferred. Under, understand that the language here is not necessarily, we is not necessarily the language that we would put in a bill if we did a bill. So promote, um, I think what we had in mind when we were writing this was to clarify what local governments are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Because at this point, it's as a Dillon Bull state, unless you're explicitly given that authority to do something, I know some local governments tend to have some heartburn over doing something that they're not very clearly or don't have the express permission to do. So this was something I think we had in mind just to be like, no, you're not going to get sued if you do this. Right. That was, I think, the intent of this bullet point. And, that, and to Grace's point, I mean, we've had folks get body awards and say to us, despite that we partner with X company, 
and we go, well, you've got to help market the service to the area. And they're going, well, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, but you just got a multi-million dollar grant with XISP to build our broadband. And now you're telling me the county can't through their utility bill send out saying, hey, there's broadband in this area or go to the local library or have events. Um, and so I, I do think, as to Mike's point, there is some confusion from localities, even on a body grant. Even if they've gone through procurement to identify the ISP that they ultimately selected for a body, they still feel like they don't have the ability to even promote that the service is now available in the areas that they have a body award. So they're at least, in some instances, some confusion with localities about their ability. I'm not, not the cosign of what's being proposed. I'm just telling you that even when we are investing state money in an area, some localities are reluctant to even um, push out the service that's been funded completely through body and ISP partner. And Jason from LMRL, I think that one of the other things to consider in, in, in the positive for this kind of language um, is, is the reality that sometimes um, lawyers uh, change seats and disagree. Um, and you know, one thing that, that I think would be challenging is if you have um, one county attorney who uh, thinks that, uh, you know, you have the legislative spending authority to do this, um, and then he goes gets a different job, and now you have a different one, or she, um, and and that new lawyer disagrees, and now you are in a situation where your your attorney thinks that you no longer have the authority, and and that is something that um, you know from from our perspective, always having to ask the lawyers permission, um, it is the, the sort of thing that like now we navigate very very carefully from recent experience um, as, as we look at how we're going to navigate this. And this is this is one of the questions that's open for what we want to do in the future. Um, and so this sort of authorization would be tremendous as far as I'm concerned. Ray and Philip, you have your hands raised. Do you guys want to add something? Uh, this is Phil. Just very briefly, I mean, I think Grace and others made a good point, at least in thinking about this stuff, that the Dillon rule is a complicating factor in all this. But um, Local government attorneys love, and no offense to Eldon, but local government attorneys love to fall back on the Dillon rule as a reason not to do something. Um, and sometimes it's true, sometimes it isn't. Every lawyer you know, has their own reading of things. As a recovering attorney, I can say that. But so <laughs> it's, um, it does make it complicated, but a lot of these things, as I said before, I really feel like if the state promoted and educated and on, on some of these things that I call them best practice, maybe that's not, not the right word. Um, if you really have local government attorneys after looking at this saying, we don't have the authority to do this, then maybe we come back and revisit it. But you really need to hear that from the local government attorneys, not from you know just anecdotal sort of situations. Thanks. This is Mike Lockerbie. I'm the county attorney for Botetourt County, <laughs> the assistant county attorney for Franklin County, and the town attorney for the town of Bedford. And what I'm telling you is, local governments do not have authority to hold more than to do more than to lay dark fiber, and presumptively to put down a little bit of conduit. They also are prohibited from promoting broadband. And my advice has consistently been that all you can do in terms of promoting broadband within the locality is to put it up on your website next to the other utility providers within your locality. So, you know, you say, well, if you move into our locality, there's always a sheet that you have in your local government office or on your website that says, call AEP or call Dominion or call your co-op. Here's the telephone companies that are the, that are the local LEX. Here is the gas company. Here it is the trash companies that have some sort of a franchise in our jurisdiction. Here are the broadband companies that are in our jurisdiction. But of course, we can't tell you where they are, but they do exist in our jurisdiction to our knowledge. That's it. It would be really great to be able to say with a body program grant, with a grant that we're participating in, with situations where people aren't, I, I understand the broadband providers are trying to make, trying to promote that in areas that they have new builds in, especially areas that were previously completely unserved. But it would be great if we could also send that in our utility bills or have the Public Service Authority also provide those in the utility bills. Uh, that would be, I think, wonderful for us to be able to do. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Mike, not the. Is this a public meeting? Yes. yes. Being, being recorded. We were recording it as a public meeting. <laughs> Jason from Alvarado County. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to skip that part. Um, not to put the target on uh, our back, but um, would you say, for instance, that localities don't have the authorization to front ACT as Intergovernmental Affairs yesterday asked us to? I would have to look specifically at the situation. <laughs> would you say? But that, there's a specific section of state code that right. lays out exactly what you can and cannot do with respect to broadband without any authorization. There's a specific section of state code that lays out what you need to have authorization from the state corporation commission to do. And it's not at all clear, which is why people can disagree in the gray area there. But again, if, if you want to take it's not even a conservative approach. The 15.2-1500-D, I believe, is pretty straightforward about what you can and can't do. Bill, go ahead and chime in if you would like. There's been some hands raised and taken down online. Any any uh, folks who want to chime in, feel free to do so. Um, if not, I think we've saturated this one. It might be a good time to go on to the next. Can, can I? Maybe yeah. Steve from Baco, Franklin County. Just thinking through like a real life example of, of what we kind of run into. And so we've got a developer, um, and I'll just use Shintel because that's who's primarily in our area. Uh, they've talked to Shintel. Shintel says, yeah, we can get uh, internet service there. It's going to cost, let's just say, half a million dollars. Developer says, I ain't doing that. That's too expensive. It's too costly for me to do that. Can't afford to do that. Hey, county, what can you do to help out? It's If they come to me and say, if the developer comes to me and says, hey, we need $350,000, we can make this happen. I don't have the ability to, <laughs> to just go to my board supervisor necessarily and say, hey, give Shintel or developer B $350,000 so we can make sure this neighborhood has internet service. And so I'd love to hear some discussion about that particular type of a situation. And the numbers are made up, of course, you know, but that's, that's a common situation that we have is for me to do this development and make my numbers work and for me to provide this extra service of broadband because typically what we saw in the past is, well, broadband is at the entrance of the subdivision. You make it work. And so a lot of our body work has been, hey, now we got to get into the subdivision because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't as important as it is now. So I, I agree with Rob that now I think that problem is less than it used to be. It, it, it occurs less than it used to, but still it's going to come down to the numbers if it's too costly for this this guy bought this property further out because it's cheaper, um, but yet also needs, you know, cost, it's gonna cost more to extend water, sewer, electricity, broadband. Broadband is typically gonna be that last one, uh, even today, I think, of that extra service, as well as trails and other amenities for a subdivision that come last. And so, I'd kind of like to hear some discussion about, like, and it kind of goes to the promotion, you know, what can the local government do in those kind of situations to help the developer and the future citizens and homeowners to, to have that internet service there without violating any kind of uh, procurement or any other kind of uh, legislation that may be out there. And maybe there's a clear path that I'm not aware of, but I think the, the, the path is, not all that clear, and that could be maybe a shift in this focus. Maybe is how do we how do we help government have a more clear path to, to helping work through those types of situations? So I just throw that out there for anybody. Just <laughs> yeah, chime in because I think it's a real example, and, and some of the providers can tell me no. Well, you know, doesn't matter what it costs, we'll put it in there. I don't think that's the answer. Um, you know, but. How do we bridge that gap and how, how can we work together to, to make it happen? And how do we get past some of those governmental restrictions that we may have at the local government side uh, to help incentivize? If it's all right, 
like being like, I'll move on to the next recommendation. I think this one, will, the next two will go reasonably quickly and then we can break for 10 minutes, use that time to discuss how we want to proceed moving forward, if that's okay with everyone. So this is already in your comp plans. Sorry guys. Um, it's like, but that said, um, I think part of our charge in the bill is to look at existing state code and see what we can change, right, or improve. So this would, right now, what we have up there as a bullet point is to suggest a requirement that localities are currently required to shall to consider how broadband service or what broadband infrastructure you all need in order to meet the future, the current and future needs of your residents and businesses. So I believe the way that language is worded. Um, what we given this i think maybe there are changes that we could make to this legislation if it's at the bare minimum technical i think the right i think the text references the center for technology or something to that effect that is not in charge of broadband information we could change that to the office of broadband so this could be a purely technical amendment if we wanted to or a purely technical recommendation um also we could maybe consider how what what else we may want to include in it um the second bullet point would be to, um, and this is from our background research that we did a little bit on, um, would be to let, like to consider um, the city of Boston has a broadband ready questionnaire that they give as part of the design, I believe it is part of the design process to their developers basically being like, here's a list of five questions, not hard at all to do at all, but have you thought about this? before you build out broadband or have you thought like just very basic questions so maybe suggest or require for local governments who do have like again the perm every permitting process is very different but maybe incorporate something like that into the design construction permitting process of local government so we have that coordination between the developer local government and isp at the onset which is so important to y'all so Questions, comments, concerns. And just to tag on before we kick it over to Andrew, who just raised his hand, this was something that was brought up in B by BCTA during individual meetings. Uh, there, the discussion was potentially Spotsylvania County that had a broadband ready form uh, for for uh, for developers to go into an area eyes wide open about whether or not there was broadband service or not. We reached out to Spotsylvania; they weren't aware of a form. We can, we can still, <laughs> we, and but that's not to say it doesn't exist, right? Maybe it's another one of those S counties up there, like Stafford. Uh, but uh, wanted to put that out there. There has been some precedent of this in Virginia uh, for a you know broadband ready development uh, form that the folks would fill out during the development process. But, Thank you, Spotsylvania County, for all the work you did on this. Sorry to if you if you're if you're on the call. Sorry to have made you like go tilt up windmills for a little bit, but we appreciate the work you did. Andrew? Yeah, it's similar to my question earlier about what's the problem we're trying to fix. I mean, the comp plan and if Michelle's still on the call, we've had a lot of comp plan discussions over the last couple of years. I think it's got already got provisions related to planning for you know existing and, and future broadband needs. Yeah, and, and this is Michelle. I would agree with you, Andrew. I think we've considered many things in the comp plan, including broadband. <laughs> And I'll come to the defense of my local government friends. I mean, that comp plan, it's like it, it the statutes become the 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 dumping ground of stuff people want to fix. And, you know, let's just require them to do this. And, you know, that's why some of these comp plans take years to finish out. Um, and we're just kind of saddling with them with you know more studies and more analysis and, you know, local I mean, that comp plan process can be pretty thorough and they're looking at all those different things. So I, I guess my question is, you know, what's the need? I understand the need for comprehensive planning, but what uh, is there something they can't do that we feel like they need to be able to do under the existing statute? You know, I think this was this was just an opportunity to see if we wanted to tweak the existing language to better cater to new development. But I mean, it's uh, I understand the concern about how putting another thing into the, the and stack. Michelle, yeah. we hear your concern about, I'm sure we understand the concern about the work that goes into comprehensive plans and how long they can take. And I, that, I will jump in. I know if, if you've written a body application in the last five years, we kind of said, 
hey, if you haven't had a broadband plan, a local plan, send us the section of your comp plan that mentions broadband. And it's literally like a section of the comp plan that mentions the word broadband. And so I, I and coming from local government, I we we get it. Like we we definitely get it. But there are some inconsistencies across locality as, as to what that looks like. So I just want to point that out that we do have what have been the efforts around local broadband planning, and we often get the one page from the comp plan that says we want to do this. So. This is Steve um, or Baco. Is it, is it possible a little twist on this with the utilizing the mapping data that you got? We thought so. We thought about amending it to be like use year. like analyze the underserved individuals in your area. Like make, instead of just be like, what is the future? Like instead of just being like, consider the future infrastructure your residential and commercial development means, which could be the language is deliberately broad to basically be anything. Maybe make it a little bit more specific and be like. Think about this a little bit more here that's like again like maybe name the office of broadband in that legislation i will also be mindful that this was senator's boisco bill from 2018 so but i don't intend to completely it, yeah i don't think the um intent we i just want to be mindful of that intent as well so she was the one who carried it or actually introduced it five years ago or whatever yeah because i think as you continue to build out the, that, that mapping project, you're going to, that information is going to get more and more yeah. accurate and, and more defined to be kind of a, a, a place where providers across the state will be able to go and find those answers about the availability of, of broadband, uh, as well as developers be able to find out as, as long as you're able to get complete, accurate information from providers to, to know where those services are. I think that's what I was trying to allude to when I said maybe take the body investments, maybe take proposed new developments, get permission from the providers that turned in the map data because I know we can't share the data outside of the use of the map. And so maybe do some, again, case studies on counties that are interested in participating and say, we have a lot of new proposed new developments on the books. We'd like to know what this looks like who's on the ground and just see what, see what happens. I mean, I come from Chester County, so we're really high capacity county. I've also worked with some really low capacity counties, so I can't, I know that there's issues across the board, so we want to be mindful of that. Yeah, Jason from Albemarle, I think the, the biggest question in terms of uh, county capacity is would Lonnie be available to help? <laughs> because, you know, realistically, right now, a lot of the reasons that some of these counties are able to submit body is because of the technical support that broadband office is able to provide. And so if you were to include a comp plan, a, a, a comp plan uh, requirements to actually study, not just state a, a desire for broadband, but actually study the availability, um, that would probably require a little bit more technical support for some counties. Just to beat this to death, um, Elder James, um, I think your first bullet is already covered in 15 to yes. 22, which was one of the last things in it. And it started out as a shall, and it ended up shall consider, which is kind of like a may. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, any, any thoughts on that last bullet there? bottom as far as a uh, authorize local governments to require suggest developers as part of the questionnaire of broadband readiness so this is just Elmer County uh, this is just a you know a nudge yeah yes okay all right I think that's the book I really. appreciate that I, I think to the point of many earlier is that we need the legislation to do that uh, yeah. you know, right. the locality could and should do that and maybe going back to Bill or somebody's comment about maybe also part of this effort is kind of a best management practices uh, for, for government developers, ISPs or something. So maybe in the end, maybe there's there's two things, or that's one of the recommendations, maybe some sort of uh, Virginia locality's best management practices. Or I, I just got to imagine that that through the planning process for a development that a conversation's already occurring about something that gets stuck into the ground. I mean, you know, I, I, I just, uh, to my previous point, I, I, I don't know what this is getting at, that a local government probably is not already engaging in a conversation with. Fair enough. Do we have any uh, 
Yeah, thank you for that, Andrew. Do we have any final thoughts about this set of recommendations? And then if not, I would suggest we take a how long of a break do you think that we have time for then give us give us 10 minutes. We'll figure out whether or not the sponge needs to be working or not. <laughs> uh, and then and then yeah, we'll uh, reconvene after that and give updates. But um, and for those on the call, we'll sit, put in the chat whether or not we are going to be uh, how much of a working lunch this needs to be, if that's all right with you guys. Yeah. Is that okay with everyone? And we'll also we'll like to know by 1210 what our plans are. Hearing none, then that we'll let you guys know by 1210 what we're planning to do. Okay.
right, hey guys, our mic is now on. So. Yeah, we're just going to, for the purpose of adjourning by 2 o'clock, we're going to go down to the recommendations that we view as not least consequential, but um, m more minor in nature than the first one, right? Which theoretically may garner less discussion, so we can continue repeating while we go through this this next subset of recommendations. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cole, and he has uh, three recommendations to run through. All right, so the first is essentially a working agreement between developers, uh, BML, Bank, Over, Paladies, uh, and the broadband uh, associations uh, within the ISPs uh, that brings all three parties together in the planning and development stages of new development projects to hopefully ensure that broadband is considered for uh, new developments across the localities and common world. And just to throw some background here, um, this was a recommendation that came out of one of the individual stakeholder meetings, uh, specifically the BCTA, actually. Uh, so if, if, I don't know if Ray has been able to walk back on, but if Ray wants to, to talk to this a little bit more, I'd certainly welcome that. But uh, we don't have what the details of this cooperative agreement should look like. Uh, it would probably look like the notification of where development may be planned throughout multiple years, allowing ISPs to plan for deployments to those areas. But uh, Ray would welcome any comments from you if you have time. Yeah, no, I uh, thank you, Chandler. I don't recall giving any type of this this concept um, as a, you know, developing a cooperative agreement. I think, uh, you know, Michelle and Dean and I have been working very closely together uh, to speak kind of with one voice as we all try to work together to um, resolve the challenge of bringing broadband to those unserved. And as a fruit of these conversations, the uh, home builders have wanted to be, have asked to become involved with this conversation as well. So uh, you know, I think it's just a, a, a continued conversation and cooperative spirit that we've seen working together uh, as we develop the broadband conference. Um, and so again, I don't think anything needs to be as formal as what this bullet point is kind of presenting it to be, but we can be conduits if there are challenges on a you know, one-off basis. Um, that's my thought, and I'm not sure if Michelle has a different thought she'd like to express, but yeah, I think, again, we've been working extremely well together and um, you're know, all focused on the goal of getting to the unserved. And I'm very sympathetic to this this issue, and I think some of the some of the proposals that we, we will still address uh, can maybe look to resolve some of those. Yeah, and this is Michelle, and I'll just echo Ray's comments. I think we have been working really well. I'll give you an example. We had one locality that's been fighting for years about their broadband agreement, and Ray and I, I believe they're going to make the announcement today or tomorrow that that um you know because Ray and I worked together, we really accomplished something really cool. So I think that um you know I will just echo his comments. Well, with that, we'll keep this one uh, as, a, as an option, of course, but let's do one more. All right, so second one uh, would essentially recommend that a change be made to a qualified allocation plan for Virginia housing, which is a document they use to score applications from developers for the low income housing tax credit. Uh, currently, in uh, Virginia housing's QAP, uh, Broadband is only one point out of a couple hundred possible points. And it's optional and it's only it only apply to applications for uh, rehabilitation for the tax credits rather than uh, for the new developments as well. So this uh, would recommend that Virginia housing require broadband uh, infrastructure to be installed um, in developments that receive low income housing tax credits. This is Mike Lock, the uh, BFL, just to kind of uh, kind of bring a little bit of, of information to this. I, I recently did a, a LIHTC project, which also is used project-based vouchers. If you want to give some points or more points than just one or two, 
Uh, I suspect that redevelopment, housing and redevelopment authorities and EDAs that work in that would probably not be bothered by that. Um, however, you have outfits like, say, the Wise County Redevelopment Housing Authority, where you might still have areas where there isn't and there's never going to be broadband available. Um, and other than, you know, the whatever the, the Elon Musk Skynet thing is. Um, so it, 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 it is a little bit unfair to have it be a requirement. You're basically ruling out potential affordable housing projects in some rural areas or areas where there's just no money in having that expansion. Um, so that, that would be kind of just to bring some information to the topic. So I can just go ahead and throw up the next one. We can go. Andrew, I see you had a hand raised on the uh, in Google Meet. Feel free to unmute. Yeah, uh, Mike, Mike kind of hit on what I was going to say was, I, I think if you start to require it or if you start juicing up the points on it um, in the QAP, you, you could potentially hurt some projects where they really desperately need some LIHTC deals. And quite frankly, where LIHTC is probably the only one of the only viable games in town. Um, but now Mike, Mike hit it well. And I think um, recommend I'm reading this second one. I think that's pretty similar. Um, and I think actually they, right, the first one, I'm oh, sorry. Anyway, I'm confused, but I'm good now. Yeah, no, we actually wanted to go to the second one now to, to talk about okay. it. I just want to ask a question. So I know in the federal guidance for both home and CDBG, which and the Federal Housing Trust Fund, there is guidance that there's a lot of may, may, shall. And so would we want to potentially tweak that to say if it's in conjunction with maybe some of the federal resources? Because I know this, I mean, basically the federal government says if you're using home money to support any new development or rehabilitation broadband shall be available. And so I'm wondering, should we, if this is, if this stick, should we really focus on where there are resources to actually support them. I mean, the whole point is to get the money from that to have the broadband installed. So I'd just be curious about folks' thoughts on that. Maybe marry the two together. Well, if we don't require it, are we in the same situation that we're talking about now where we have a development that's been built and it doesn't have any country <laughs> because somebody said it was too expensive? Because I know those, at least I know the smaller counties and the avatars can go in for the whole money. To our, of our agencies. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of contrary to what the industry said earlier that we're, we're already doing this. Well, I disagree. It's not happening everywhere. And this is an example where, you know, where it's cost prohibitive, it's not happening. But I think we still need to encourage it as much as we can, or even if it's providing additional, additional financial incentives to make it happen. Thank you. So I guess probably this one might be a little more suited to what you guys are talking about, but um, this is along the same vein, but it didn't change the scoring guidelines in the qualified allocation plan to award more points to broadband infrastructure in uh, developments, and it would add new developments uh, in addition to rehabilitation. because as I said, uh, currently the one optional point is only for uh, tax credits for rehabilitating um, developments that already exist. Uh, so this would add maybe uh, a higher point, uh, more available points for broadband infrastructure uh, for new developments. Um, John Lee, um, back to Mike's point. Look, I know broadband is important. And I certainly hope it stays important because we've invested a lot of time and energy in it. But is it more important than somebody having a roof over their head? I mean, even though do anything that might even remotely jeopardize low income housing or an opportunity for someone to move into a you know, place that has insulation and reasonable electric bills and everything else. I mean, it really want to jeopardize that for that. So I think to clarify, and maybe we should have been more explicit in these recommendations, one of them was to need, make it a yes or no. Like if we did not provide broadband as part of the affordable housing, it wasn't eligible for like that. This would just be out of the hundreds of points that you can get for your like that scoring application. You just maybe get a couple more points for broadband. So a couple more points might throw your project out of consideration, right? 
Yeah, but, but to be the, the devil's advocate, right? <laughs> if you don't do it, then you're continuing the digital divide. Yeah. Right? I'm going to give you an example. So right. most folks know we have a line extension program. We got a request for a county for an 84 unit affordable housing unit that has no access to property. They want a line extension to, to an 84 unit affordable housing development. And I don't know how that 84 affordable housing unit does not have property. Like I, it does not make sense to me that that they want us to subsidize that. Because the argument could be those are the folks that need it even more. Right. And so, so with that came through again, listen, man, you know. <laughs> All this conversation is a little weird to me because we're going to do it anyway. I mean, we're, yeah. we're just, and we're just different. We serve a highly rural area. There's not much options where we are anyway. So, but I really would hate to see a locality lose an opportunity like that because of that. You know, as far as the co-ops go, we we're gonna we're gonna cover the basis. So, so is it? Can you not? If if that's the case, if John's concern is valid, that the case would be that. They could miss out on that opportunity. Could it not be that the that, that broadband would give you bonus points? I mean, yeah, you know, it, could be, it could be like a plus up. Yeah. It could yeah. be uh, so in other words, that would encourage that additional that's a much bonus. better approach. Yeah. Uh, Let's so, to, so to your question, we were asked to weigh in on the QAP question, the QAP document that happened during the transition between the two administrations. I don't know what happened to the recommendations we made to Virginia Housing. And so this kind of Help, helps us have a formal conversation with Virginia Housing about the live tax process. But, but to the point, the points have to be enough to offset the extra cost. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's why I say, you know, one is you don't want to continue the digital divide, and to do that, I think you need to look at making that a bonus point option so that you don't impact the, uh, the ability to, to do the affordable housing in the first place. I just have a question for developers. I know a lot of them get the live tax credits and then they syndicate the credits. On the tax syndication side, are the syndicators there? Like if a Virginia Community Development Corporation who's often a syndicator and tax credit project, are they are they asking those types of questions before they provide the cash for the credits? Um, I can't speak for a syndicator clearly, but I, I, I they probably look at the deal itself and the economics of it and the market of it, but I'm not sure they're diving into does it have broadband. Okay. But that'd be a great question for Bob Newman. Yeah. I'm going to send him an email. Andrew, could you speak to the demand for the light tech tax credits from the developers? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So that's I guess maybe warning, maybe it would allay some of the concerns people have about like his fault. Like it's not like this development won't there won't be affordable housing because there isn't broadband. It'll just go to a different locality if it has it receives the, those points, right? If that application scores higher because they have broadband, it'll just go to someone else, right? Yeah, I mean, and so I kind of threw this question out earlier, and I'd probably throw it again, I'd throw it out again for this: Is is anybody asked VHDA in the last? couple of years how many applications have been submitted i mean it's a checkbox yes do you have broadband no do you you know do you not have broadband infrastructure you know are we getting a ton of applications that are projects without uh, broadband infrastructure other than the one that was cited i i just maybe um but it would be interesting to know where those projects are coming up um if they if they don't that may be a way to kind of hone the focus of of our of our efforts um grace i think the first part of your question was were you asking how essential they are the demand for litec yes yeah the demand for litec is is pretty strong and that's why the last set last session the last couple of years we've been working to set, set up a state equivalent of the federal litec program because it's honestly the most effective affordable housing incentive and tool out there I think it's done like 100,000 units in the last 20, 30 years in Virginia. Um, and these are long-term affordable units. It's not kind of one year and then it gets sold, uh, you know, it's rental. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a 30-year kind of binding agreement that it's, it's held in affordability. And a lot of them after that 30-year compliance period maintain their affordability. Um, so they're, they're pretty essential. Um, 
uh, they're they're in high demand, and then for the developer, they 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 go a long way in kind of filling some of the gaps in the financing that you really can't get for, through uh, conventional means. So uh, the short answer is there's there's huge demand for the credits. Andrew, so I know. See, this just makes me think about the intersection between the site plan review because I mean these are the at least for the the new developments. If this was done on the site plan, you wouldn't need it in the LIHTC if the property was a, if the development was being, if it was utilizing credits, we would know up front, right? I'm not sure I'd say that question again. And we were talking about like during the planning process for a locality during the plan review, if they talk, if they coordinate it better between the ISP, the utilities and the developer, would this even be, would this be a moot point, but regardless if it was LIHTC or not, because it would have been taken care of on the development run the plan process. That, that was my question. Um, I'm not totally tracking, but it is it is Friday. I mean, the broad. <laughs> I basically say that we took care of this from a on the on the planning side and the site review side. Does it matter if it's a live tech property or not? Right. So what we're saying is specifically for live tech properties, we would want Virginia housing to consider bonuses. However, a lot tech property development is no different than any other development other than it has tax credit. Right. So that's that's okay. my question. All right. I got you. Yeah. I mean, the 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 idea behind LIHTC was to create, you know, units that are, you know, look similar to, to market rate units. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of a development standpoint, you know, there's not it's not like a LIHTC project gets developed any differently than a than a you know traditional or market rate or above market rate single family or multifamily project. I think that the point is, and, and maybe this is worthwhile kind of diving into VHDA's numbers is, you know, uh, there are probably a handful of projects um, where there's not broadband. Um, and again, I'm, I'm basing that anecdotally off after of reading some. Um, you would just hate for somebody who's doing the first residential development south somewhere southwest of Mike and Badatot um, to you know lose a point or five points um, and uh, based on broadband and that project doesn't go to a locality that really desperately needs some some new rental housing stock. I think that's that's my only concern. I don't, I don't know if it's going to make or break the project but you, you do run that risk of kind of overweighting so to speak the broadband side of things thank you well i think it makes sense to backtrack now to, to, yeah to, to where we're going to begin at where we left off at with lunch This category is all about uh, funding programs that would export, that would support the expansion to new development. Uh, the first of which, um, just to talk through a little bit, is essentially a, a scaled down uh, version of the body program that would support expansion to one, pockets of unserved areas that may have been left outside of previous body projects for whatever reason, uh, and two, new developments. Say a new development is on the, uh, Lake Gaston, which has recently been built, the body that wasn't previously in a body project area, uh, but it can be picked up easily without having to go through the entire body process, so the year-long body process, which has transformed into mostly entire county builds uh, for just one subset or subdivision of the locality. Uh, I think the, the uh, just to kick off discussion here, I think the only concern under this standpoint is what would stop this program just becoming, uh, I guess, what, what, under what circumstances would this program not have to exist in perpetuity to expand service and developments, right? I mean, you know, the body program by design should have an expiration date. Therefore, this program by design ought to have an expiration date. How do we continue to encourage this without having to invest more and more and more funds into it uh, annually? At least that's my take. Uh, I should clarify. Wait, don't you want to do your job? Yeah. We're working ourselves out of a job. It's okay. <laughs> I knew that going in. 
So uh, anyways, just to, just wanted to open up discussion there, see what the uh, thoughts were on a funding program to support the expansion of solely broadband. The next conversation point is about infrastructure generally, but this is just about broadband. So thoughts on this point. I'm Laura Cotty. Um, I think that the, the, the idea of looking at a body 2.0 um, is great, and, and there should be a lot of time expended on that. Um, outside of this meeting, but I think that my worry with a new development question is making sure that you get the timing right. Uh, and the fact that their private developers have the right to pull out at any time. So you could have a situation where um, in a couple of years we have a really nasty recession, everybody puts things on hold, and it's 18 years later. I mean, you're gonna be holding that $4 million that you set aside to serve 1,200 homes for 18 years, and then come back and it's like, well, that $4 million really needs to be $20 million in today's dollars. Um, I think that that's a real risk um, for a program targeting new developments. Now, um, if you narrowed the time frame, you know, you made it really tight. You said, this is a commitment. We're going to build this in 18 months. And then you just did it. Um, then that's, you know, that's a different story. It's, it's hard to, to, to envision, especially when you're working with private developers, that would work out well. Um, as far as the pockets, like that sounds great. Um, like again, expanding or looking at a body 2.0 to serve the remaining needs, underserved areas, uh, that sounds great. Ray, do you have a thought? Yes, um, and quite frankly, I wish we had started our conversation four hours ago with this <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> and I don't want Chandler or Tamara or Grace to lose their jobs, and quite frankly, I see that, uh, as John Lee was pointing out earlier, uh, hopefully our, our tremendous success with Batty and the accomplishment of bringing broadband to all those unserved. Quite frankly, I see this as the evolution to this point that would be ongoing because as development continues. Um, I, I think this is probably the area today that we need to spend more time on um, I think it is uh, really trying to, to solve those problems of the Swiss cheese in unserved areas. And I, I heard, you know, the word underserved addressed earlier, and I'm not sure if that was uh, a misspeaking, but you know, the focus that we have all been brought to this table for and the focus of the Broadband Advisory Council is to bring broadband to those unserved. And I think that this is uh, headed in that direction, in that spirit, and I think this is where we need to spend our time on. Andrew, you also have a hand up online. Yeah, and I was just going to say, um, this is, and I think Chandler and Grace, we talked about this. This kind of is connected to uh, an initiative that we're working on, hopefully for this upcoming year, really targeted on, on more rural areas where the demand for housing's uh, really strong new housing and then just new housing stock to replace some of the older existing housing stock and developers will tell you there's a couple things that are kind of preventing them from even uh, exploring some of those ideas it's one just kind of knowing where to go and that's kind of building a, a, a development community and moving it outside of the kind of urban crescent um, it's water and sewer infrastructure it's road infrastructure uh, and, and, and broadband. And so the idea was to set up a fund that you could, you know, you know, and not just dump it into every subdivision that, you know, pops up and says, I want to build a home, but, you know, projects that could be really catalytic um, in rural areas that have seen some recent economic development projects that have seen, you know, uh, just demographics changing where there's a, a demonstrated need for it and, and targeting those funds to work directly with the development community to to get those projects going online. And, and as a part of that, we included broadband in that kind of package of, of infrastructure needs. So, I mean, I, I think this is one of the um, areas that you could see really drive some change and, and drive builders and developers to either look at new sites or, um, you know, move forward with a project that they may otherwise not have brought in and, and actually have them have that infrastructure. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a great endeavor to kind of look at. I think that that may also be best 
serve as a transition to the next point as well. Grace, do you want to yeah. go over that? I mean, then we can yeah. consider kind of both yeah. at the same time, yeah, whether so it makes sense to have two separates. Which, so can you click forward? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so Andrew, if you want to go ahead and cover this slide. Or if we, we oh, that. sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> I no, jumped I, the gun. All right, well, this one looks good, too. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're totally good, but I do think there is something you said about considering them together. They are similar ideas, um, and I think you did explain it quite well, honestly, in terms of like what the need is and what the purpose of this recommendation would be. Right? For I talked to a couple of our other staff members before the meeting yesterday about like what are like the costs when it comes to these sort of things. And I'm like, you have no idea how much super cost to lay down. Right, like you have no, like you like just explain what those costs are and where they are, and if you were going to include those structures, we might as well include broadband in this as well. Um, I think a couple of notes to this fund as well is is there are different themes and variations we could there isn't really a state equivalent of this. Like our housing trust fund does not do this sort of thing. We and there are other maybe state funded programs that maybe target one of these things maybe the water portion or maybe like the electricity portion but nothing that is just such an oak that it's just building out a new development helping with that infrastructure expansion also i did before anyone asked look at the infrastructure investment and jobs act and i don't think dangerous statement public meeting that's being recorded Someone knows more, please let me know. But I'm not sure if there's anything in there specifically for building out infrastructure into new development. I don't, there might be pieces of it that target different portions, but nothing that's like a comprehensive pot for all of these things together. Um, and there are a couple of other things that we could do. And also, if anyone knows more about that, please correct me if you're wrong. It's a 2,000 page bill. Well, I was trying to say, yeah. so <laughs> say if, you, if you're from a county that gets funding through DHCD, through CDBG, and Steve and I have talked about this in the past, CDBG can do this, but CDBG is a very limited resource. CDBG also has the, I know this is being recorded the later, of federal yeah, requirements, probably. right? And so yeah. there's, I mean, we only get $18 million as a state, so there would never be enough money through CDPG. Um, and so I, I'm not gonna speak for the developers, but I also know having worked on LATEX slash CDPG slash home slash housing trust fund projects in my old days, the subsidy layering that takes to make a project, a housing project affordable is already a nightmare of regulations and rules. I can't imagine if if it was not a state resource, what it would look like if it was only a federal resource. I'm just gonna say that out loud. So there's that. And also there are other um there are other things that we can do like with the funds that are like obviously again, none of the bullet points are perfect. Um it, we could limit this to lower moderate income housing. We could make it limit, like we could change the language so that it's for historically divested areas or whatever. We can make it for residential development only or commercial development only. We could change like that um you can make it a revolving loan fund there are lots of, like it's a fund right you can drink like there are a million different ways in which we could and plan to do this but that's um i think considering like this with the with chandler's point earlier are a good idea because they're both programs that require funding and how and are looking to kind of solve this problem prospectively yeah so the, the only extra point to hit would be under the broadband only category of this idea that would be a uh, bead program eligible use bead is the pot of federal funding coming down to the infrastructure act um, we don't see a easy path on the eligibility of water and sewer infrastructure being expanded under any other iija program yeah, the first one would be more like an enhanced health yeah yeah all right uh, Andrew had a hand up first, and right. Well, I answer one point. There's a com there's a point made about residential or commercial too. I, since Phil's not on here, I don't think I'll say just residential. It can only. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the 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 other idea that we've explored with this is almost having this fund be similar to a LIHTC, where you establish a general kind of overarching program, right, and you don't have the legislature putting priorities um uh into the program and so you really have a living document in the qap where you can say hey you know do we need to really do something to help you know veteran housing or do we need to incentivize more rural development where you can kind of use 
more of a regulatory process, which oddly enough seems more flexible sometimes to really drive policy. And so, you know, the idea on this was to have this kind of fund that would be set up through the state um, and then almost have a, a, a scoring system kind of based on some analysis of where the need is and where the demand is. And, and, uh, and you can, you know, kind of target rural areas or you can have extra points for, you know, projects that incorporate um, or that are mixed income projects, um, but not make it just solely designated for to low to moderate income. And, and I say that as somebody who really fights for LIHTC and affordable housing on top of market rate housing. There are some jurisdictions um, where, you know, some of the traditional definitions of low and, and, and moderate income, there's a need, but there's also a really strong need for, you know, what I guess some would call workforce housing or somewhere at like the 80 to 100 percent AMI. So I'd, I'd only caution about caution to, to have a recommendation that was narrowly tailored to just one segment of residential. I, I think that's something that that, you know, whoever, whatever entity ends up overseeing this kind of fund um, could could determine and, and kind of be flexible about. But, you know, leaving it leaving it a little broader makes it more of a of a palatable program uh, for all jurisdictions who are dealing with different issues and 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 uh, and you know, kind of gets more of the development community saying, "All right, this fund is is something that's open to me, and it makes a project in Danville or it makes a project in Franklin a little more viable." So that's my soapbox. I'll jump off. Thanks for listening to our conversations. <laughs> this is Steve and Franklin. Uh, this is what. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so I wonder if DHCD staff may be able to reach out to the Virginia Resource Authority. Uh, I know they're doing work in this space already, and there may be some type of partnership that could exist there. And maybe um, our friends at VML Bico, you know, have, have some insight there. But the Virginia Resource Authority could be a vehicle or instrument to, to consider. And also, I would say I think um, you know, tying things to low and moderate income housing as we work on these infrastructure builds out for the for these areas. I think what we're seeing is, you know, we have people who are not in low to moderate income, but who live a little little farther off of the road, or the development's going to go a little farther off the road, or the farmer is a little farther off the road, and so uh, tying it to low to moderate income, I, I think, can hamstring us and bringing broadband to someone who's uncertain. So that's just two thoughts. And this is Steve from, from Baco and Franklin. I, I kind of see this almost as site readiness. You, you know, the state has a site readiness program, which is designed to grade sites, bring infrastructure. To me, this is just the residential version of that. So I don't know, you know, if there's a way to, to develop something like that for residential development, which is highly needed across the state, uh, but especially in those rural areas, like like Andrew said, the two really go hand in hand. Um, you know, we're trying to attract business that's going to generate hundreds of jobs, but we got nowhere for people to live. So, um, if there's some, you know, synergy there between the two, and you know, I don't know if it's something Virginia Housing administers or if it's you know how that works, but uh, I think having some sort of formula that can target the right areas for the money to go to, you know, kind of to Andrew's point, um, you know, would be a great, a great way to do that. And, you know, developers are building in Richmond and building half a million dollar homes because that's what the market, you know, demands. And so Andrew and I have had this discussion is like, how can I get some of those developers to come to Franklin and just build? Well, they, they're doing just fine where they are. They're making enough money where they are. They really don't have a need or desire necessarily to, to, to come and develop in, you know, Southwest Virginia or, or somewhere else. And so having some sort of incentivation, some way to incentivize them to, to build housing in those areas is really, I think, what is highly necessary. So I don't know the perfect way to get there. But the, this is Mike Locke, BBML and Toa. Um, I, I think that Ray's comment about Virginia Resources Authority is, is 
100% on point because we have the water supply revolving fund, the water facilities revolving fund, and we have the never capitalized but still existing um, broadband infrastructure revolving fund. And that's way too, there's three different programs. It's probably too clunky for, for doing what we're talking about doing. But the idea of those programs is that you can fund projects that are administered by BDH and DEQ, but, and you could have DHCD or Virginia Housing perform that function of administrating and scoring. And then VRA has a tranche of, or a layer of grant money, as well as a layer of loan money that you can get in on in order to do those things. There's a scoring and application process. You could set that up for new development. And at that point, and Andrew, I'm probably way oversimplifying what your folks actually do, but you're creating a situation where the developer is borrowing X amount of money for their capital stack from a bank in order to get the actual development done and the dirt turning done and the buying of the sticks and putting them together. And then you've got this additional thing into the capital stack where you're recovering, um, you're recovering the money potentially off of user fees. I think that I'd like to see, remember how we had that legislation that allowed you to create a service district to fund broadband mm -hmm. through conduit bonds? It would be really interesting to see, I don't know that anybody's actually done that, but it'd be interesting to see one of those actually happen. When I have looked, when I've worked with somebody who's looking at one of those, the reason why it didn't happen was the difficulty of going through the process of issuing a mini bond did not was not worth the point spread that you gain by issuing a muni bond versus private borrowing. But as we see bank loan rates and corporate bond rates continue to have five, 600 basis point point spreads versus muni bond rates, you might see that becoming a really useful thing to go forward. It'd be great to see one of those happen and then see if that was a pattern that we could repeat and, and broaden into uh, water and sewer as well. I know but, private entities allowed to apply, to apply to VRA because I know for most of the resources in the county typically has to, or an authority has to apply. Yes, and that's why I say it's it's not a perfect analogy okay. and it's a little bit, and it, it, it doesn't fit, but I, I, I don't reinvent the wheel if I can avoid it. If I have, if somebody wants an easement this week, I take the document I did two weeks ago that has an easement that was kind of similar and re, rework it. I don't try to create from scratch. Okay. Just not how I do things. Because I wonder if anyone remembers, I think some folks are on here. A few years ago, before COVID, there was a tobacco commission meeting where they were offering loans to some of the folks that applied to tobacco grants. It went to, it didn't last long, but VRA was supposed to be the servicer of those loans. I'm assuming that they would have been able to service them because it would have gone directly to, I know, I think some of the, like Scott, I remember just um, Bill Hunter from Scott County Telephone talking at the meeting. And so I guess there are, there are maybe some options with VRA to do some direct financing to private entities. Or do the five, or again, you'd probably need to do some funky footwork with the uh, enabling legislation for such a thing. But you could set it up so that if it was a pure pass-through grant, pure, pure pass-through load that the locality was also sponsoring, frankly, from VRA's underwriting standpoint, that would probably be a credit enhancement. Yeah. Okay, cool. thank you. Andrew, you have a hand raised? Yeah, I was going to say Mike nailed it on, on the first part of his comments. Well, all of his comments, but the, the first part was really the genesis of the concept was you've got, uh, we tried to find them all, find a handful of them, but there's so many different funds out there that folks and, and grants and whatever that people can pull from to kind of spur development, whether it's water and sewer and all these different things. And the concept was try to consolidate that all into kind of one place you know, builders and developers are, are smart people, but they're not smart to go to nine different agencies to try to piece together things. And so trying to consolidate that all into a kind of one one spot just makes it more of a, a palatable um, uh, uh, process to go through. And, and you know, DHCD, in my mind, and, and I'm not wed to that, but DHCD kind of being the center of economic development, community development, residential housing, it just seems like a, a a nice clearing house or a nice place to to park that um you know because dhcd has hooks into you know kind of the market rate world the affordable housing world the 
uh, supportive housing world, and it just seems like there's a lot of synergy there. All good points. Um, I think it makes sense to go on to the next one. Are we good with the? Um, are we good with our first recommendation of this series? I think. Does anyone else, I guess, have um, any thoughts about this particular recommendation before we move on? Because I think we we kind of tied both of those in, tied the fun and this one together. I just want to make sure that everyone who wanted to say something or has talked about this has had a chance to say what they wanted to say. It seems like there is general consensus that these could be two separate standalone programs. But, but this one more for existing development, not necessarily new development. Got it. Got it. Okay. Are we good to? Yeah. All right, then I'm going to move on. All right. So this is one of one of our later recommendations too, but the idea here being is pretty much what it sounds like, but allow for a local government to say, hey, this parcel or here, this area is broadband ready. It has, unless you guys already have the authority, this might be one of those recommendations again, where it's like, we can already do this. Why do we need the authorization to do this? Well, again, back to the whole like the county attorneys and what they have opinions on. Um, but to be able to say like, this area is broadband ready and we Generally, when we were talking about this, we thought about using the FCC definition of like ten within ten days of hookup, right? And basically say like, hey, marketing, like economic development, we have broadband here. Please bring your business here, and just designate areas as broadband ready. And we thought maybe one way to do that is at least with our new broadband availability map. Right now, there is very tight budget language, or well. Chandler thinks there's very high budget language around it. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> and Ray does too. And Ray does too. All right, fine, fair enough. That there's tight budget language that's <laughs> saying we can use the map for what we want. <laughs> we Sorry, can, Ray. We can use the map pretty much for what it says, but maybe just slightly tweaking it to allow for localities to say, like, to the extent to which the census block overlaps with like a parcel or something like that. To say that, hey, this area has broadband. If you want to bring a business here, we can hook you up. So that's pretty much the extent of this definition. And I may have stuck my foot in foot my mouth, and if I did, I apologize to everyone in the room. But we could just well, well, open to thoughts about this. Yes, this could this could be modeled after. So, for example, some localities uh, may consider specific parcels, specific areas as a designated technology zone. Yeah. So you know, could there be a, a way for a local government to sort of find areas broadband ready. Um, this could also be pared down even to mimic a previous recommendation about, you know, could could a, you know, if a developer came to a local government, could that local government check with an ISP to certify a, a new development would be broadband ready once built. Um, so uh, why it's this is more wide open, I think, than what it what it seems. But open for suggestions here. It may also be best considered with the next next recommendation on the list as well. Do we want to move on to the next one? There's Ray. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I am, guys. Sorry. Um, I'm a huge promoter of this concept, and I'm not sure, again, if we need authorization for local governments. I think this is something that you know, VEDP can be made aware of, and even the Department of Tourism. Um, you know, Virginia is for lovers. Virginia is broadband ready. I think it's a bigger concept rather than um, you know, having to you know go through the process of legislation to authorize a local government to, to talk about this. I, I think this is something we can do and we can be creative and it's something again, email and Bacon and we can all work together and, and, and chime in cooperatively. I think this is just a more of a PR opportunity. Indiana has a very similar program now. Um, oh, shoot, did I just, sorry. I stole their thunder, let me be quiet. Uh, I think the speaking order online is Michelle and Andrew. Yeah, so this is Michelle. I will tell you, Dean and I talked about this a couple of years ago and just creating it ourselves because we thought that was a good idea. So I, I agree with Ray. I'm not sure you need legislation. It really is more promotional than anything. Um, was the idea behind this to have like local incentives so 
you know, in the code, there's a bunch of different zones. There's like redevelopment zones, tech zones, I think Chandler mentioned. And there's usually, you know, different incentives tied to those zones. Or is this purely marketing, kind of a PR kind of deal? Speaking from personal opinion, I think just broadband availability is already an incentive enough. This would just be a marketing tactic, tactic, uh, tactic for local governments. Oh, gotcha. All right. I, I didn't know if you, the idea was, oh, well, I guess I could have read the title and figured it out. I was thinking the idea was areas where a locality, you know, knows there's going to be a, you know, there's potential for future economic development, whether it's residential or mixed use or commercial and, and areas designated and there's certain, you know, benefits or efficiencies that are generated from, you know, pursuing a project in that zone. but. I may have been misreading. I don't want to John Lee off his chair or our friends at Dominion, <laughs> but maybe we could attach these to utility poles, some signs like that. Oh, easy. <laughs> easy. You know, Ray, we were getting along really fine. Right? <laughs> Next recommendation. Can <laughs> I talk about poles? Uh, I think I think this is I, I have high hopes for this next one. I'll be up front. Yeah, we we like we do uh, like this one. This I was gonna do it. If anyway. you're if you're one <laughs> if you're a person to look at road signs, sometimes you might see a locality designated as a road as a bird sanctuary or the home of bluegrass music in Virginia. <laughs> this would establish a program that you know, once the local government's project body project expansion has been one hundred percent completed. They could apply to DHCD and other certifying organizations to say you are now a broadband ready locality. Uh, one key consideration here, you know, I think that it's important that if a locality is considered broadband ready, that you know there's been a, a fast checker behind the scenes to make sure that you know, infrastructure actually is available to whatever X percentage, 98%, 99% of locations to be considered you know, universally served. Um, what that would require is a change in the budget language, and we broached this in the last point. Uh, under the service territory data that DHCD collected from service providers, um, for the sole purpose of being able to certify whether 98% or whatever percentage of units in the local government actually have broadband availability based on the most recent broadband data service territory submission. Thoughts there. I think I think the biggest point will be around you know what the HCD is committed to use service territory data for the purpose of. Um, would especially be curious hearing thoughts from internet providers on this. But um, this is Rob with the uh, GIA. Um, I mean, you guys are going to have the maps, right? So as we are building out the Batty grants, we're getting other grants for providing you that data. And you're going to have the maps to be able to tell not only what parts of the county are ready, but you know, all, all, all the way down to the street level, basically, right? So, I mean, you could actually develop this broadband ready communities, broadband ready neighborhood, broadband ready whatever, you know, um, because you guys will have that data. I mean, and we're going to be supplying you that data because we don't want you to provide funding to others to overbuild us. I mean, so. You know, I'm sitting here thinking I've got a meeting with King and Queen County next week. I'm going to bring this up to their board and say, if they ever do this program, then you need to submit because when we get done, over 90 some percent of your county is going to be passed by. I think the issue here, and like that's right, I and mean, I had a conversation. We have the information to be able to do this. We're just not allowed because of the budget language to use it, quote unquote, in that way. Because we'd have to use your data from your body project, but we'd have to use Cox's lines yeah. data and Cox. We'd have to take everybody's data and work and it together it. to make King and Queen be a broad. The only thing we're allowed to do is use your data to use the, to make the map. We're not actually allowed to use the map to do anything, <laughs> right? Like that's the, like that's the very technical lawyery reading of that language. So you're, you're telling me you can't use the map to decide whether or not the area is funded or not? You can't you can't use the map in yeah. general at this point because it's still at the census block level, right? It's not it's not the location level of service. It just tells you the location level of service, right? Right, but we can't take that data and do anything with it. Because of items 
seven under section P PHCB budget. That's your local legislation. <laughs> so, so that would be that would be one recommendation we would consider making if we want to do this for it would just be really helpful to be able to have use what we have to do this. Yeah. And we would have to get the right now, based on the way it's written, we'd have to get the written permission of the providers in an area to utilize the data they gave us for the for our Matt with Virginia Tech for a purpose other than the serviceability map. And that's 57 different providers. Right. So let's say we were we set up the certification program uh, and tomorrow because their project is completed, Surrey County applies for this program. We that we designate them certified. We did in fact check it with service territory data providers. We're gonna hear from 50 to 100 constituents tomorrow about you know how is this county certified and broadband ready? I don't have service. What are you gonna do about it in uh, it's just I, it, it's this avenue. Just the best way to be the most confident about this program is to have the ability to use that data for this purpose. Yeah, John Lee. Uh, uh, you know, somebody mentioned earlier it is Friday afternoon, and I'm not the sharpest tack in the box to begin with, but uh, I just don't see any downside to this. You know, yeah. we no. we can support this easily. Any other thoughts from folks online? Uh, yeah, this is Ray. Um, Michelle and I were just kind of texting. This is maybe this is something that the you know VCTA, VML, and VACO can do, uh, especially as you're kind of doing a ribbing or broadband lighting project. Um, that's just a thought. And work in conjunction again with tourism or something like that. But I think this is something the associations could could lean into. Yeah, and this is Michelle. I agree. I think that I think we really could make this really cool along with our um, broadband conference each year. So, right, do you think that we can use the data we currently get from the map to determine that? Because the problem is, is we'd have to actually be able to go literally address parcel by parcel to determine if a community is ultimately broadband ready or not. And so right now we can't do anything with the location based data. We have it, but we can't do anything with it. Well, and this is Michelle, I don't want to speak over Ray, but I guess my question would be if you're not handling the program and it's something that the associations are doing, I think that's a different conversation, right? Yeah, but how do we know that they're broadband ready? How will we how will we verify that? Well, I don't think we would ask you to. I think that we would decide what the criteria are as associations and, and manage the program. Yeah, okay. which may produce 133 different designation criteria. But I mean, you know, other than that, I mean, it's it, it's it's a way to handle program. Okay. How many? The, 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 the sum of cities and counties. Oh, no, 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 the, the towns are going to want in on this guy. <laughs> Hello. Like, and more, and then also when all the constituents talk to us, being like, wait, how are we broadband ready? We don't have, like, then we'll just send them over there. All right. Yeah, that's one way to do that. That's one way to do it. Okay. So I can't be Indiana now. That happens for me. <laughs> Very cool. Logo. But we've reached we reached the end of the line on recommendation or recommendation. I think it was pretty clear early on. We're not going to run through these again. Uh, <laughs> but it's so, Friday for all of our six. But um, in the last you know allocated forty five minutes, we're going to get out of here by two o'clock. Uh, any other thoughts from the group? Any any items that the group wants to revisit? What our responsibility as DHCD is from here is to figure out which ones of these recommendations uh, is classified as consensus. We we write the report. Um, we send that report out to the group uh, a week or so in advance for our next meeting on September 1st, uh, and then come to this conversation again to make sure that we got it right, representing what the consensus recommendations were based on this meeting. Um, so are there any final thoughts from the group in terms of these ideas, anything that DHCB should emphasize in this next you know, couple weeks as we write the report, anything that we should stay away from? I mean, this is wide open at this point. Also, you are more than welcome to email us or call us after the fact as well. So if you think of something later on, please feel free to contact us. Yeah, what, what I was going to ask John Lee well, with the co-ops is, if, if you, I assume you want some kind of a straw vote here to see what we can live with and what we can't live with. And 
uh, while I have pretty strong feelings about them, I, I would like to bounce them off those that I'm here to represent as well. So if we can, okay. if we can send you an email and just you know take each one of them, and say can't live with this, can't can't live with that, strongly support this, intend to oppose that, whatever the case may be, uh, if we really, could do that, it'd be great. If you feel like, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you all need to go back and talk to those who you represent and confer and talk them over with the information that you've had and what you've heard today. I think that would be, I think that would be fine. Does a couple weeks seem reasonable. August 5th. Need, needed yeah. sooner rather than later, so we actually write it. I mean, I think we have a sense about which ideas are yeah. leaning to the more consensus <laughs> side. Yeah. I can't imagine how. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. No, I mean, the, 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 the two funding programs, right, there is general consensus around those those two ideas. Um, I think I think there's some work to do on that last one in terms of, you know, who's a certifying body would be in a broadband ready designation. I mean, we, we can go through those details, but I mean, you know, some details this report, this report likely won't touch on. You know, so I mean, we can't flesh out a hundred percent of every single idea that we're going to write about in this report. We're not going to write the program, but you know, we're going to get we're going to get as close as possible to you know represent what the consensus recommendations were. Uh, but any just to offer, I guess, one last time, any any closing thoughts? Here? So just to clarify. Um, <clears throat> Are we going to go to our group back with these information, or are you guys going to send us your, you know, a more modified list? My take on it is send send out that list to your groups. Um, it's I don't necessarily know. I mean, do we have the breakdown of the last set of recommendations? So that that was what Cole covered right after lunch. And that's right? on the back of that sheet. Yes, we can. We can circulate. We will yeah. circulate the PowerPoint with you all. We can circulate the recording with you all if you would like. Anything else? I guess breakdown of. I'm gonna guess I'm a little unsure what you mean about like the last what that. If you go mean. back, we have here. Um, I don't see any any of those on this list. Recommend to change the Virginia Housing UAP. The very last two. Oh, I see. All right. Go, we go back. So we have all those. Yes. I think the order was that might be. Yeah. yeah. Well, so what we did in the this launch is we went through. We thought we like we would we read we we read the order while okay. the it's like let's do the things while you're eating that we can get through. All right. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> Chandler, can you? Can you clarify the, the mapping data? Do you does the state have and I'm assuming the answer is no, does the state have the ability to share shape files with localities? Not under the current budget language. Okay. And that would be something else I would suggest that just because one of those those bullets um, it was for the um authorized local governments to issue broadband ready areas. Yeah. yeah. Well what would be great, and we've done it a little bit, but but we don't have all the data is in our GIS system to have a listing when someone goes and looks at a piece of property, they know whether it's, um, you know, they know what the zoning is, they know what other, you know, aspects of it are. If, if we were able to in our GIS data to say broadband, yes or no, or here are the broadband providers that, that serve this property, they reach out to the provider after that, but somebody could just look it up and see. Well, my property doesn't have broadband yet, or hey, Chintel is my provider or Cox or whoever it is. Um, we have some of that data, but we don't have all of it unless we've worked with them on a body application. So um, I don't know if, if that's something that can be considered as making that data more readily available, but I'm sure some of the providers may not <coughs> like that idea or, or want that information. But, to a large degree, it's a lot of it's public, especially on the body side. Yeah, I mean, it's, we it's have public. Submitted, that's what I didn't understand. When we submit the body application, it's not part of the information you have to provide. Yeah. 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 All of it. I mean, you can punch an address in it. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. Or yeah. yeah. Similar yeah. idea, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I guess the issue is not all that data is out there. Uh, right. Some, some are better than others for providing it. 
Yeah, from that we can, because those are that information can't be it's not protected. This is written within the budget language that that information is automatically protected. Not for what? Or from FOIA. From FOIA. <laughs> from from FOIA. FOIA. Sorry. I don't know FOIA protects. From FOIA. Okay. From FOIA. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Just a, a final point I'll say, just going back to like the site readiness. And to me, there's so many similarities to economic development here with, you know, housing and broadband really the new, if you will, or the economic development kind of initiative, I think that, that we need to be looking at across the state is how do we provide more housing? How do we provide housing that has access to broadband? And if we, if it's a little bit work, we can certainly when looking at these recommendations, think about ways in which we can come up. Like I like, I really, I think the um, residential site readiness. Like how do we, how do we get this to collaborate and be done in conjunction with the state economic development programs? I think would be something that we can certainly look at when we write the report. Jason from Albemarle. Um, I, I think that circling back to what Bill, I think, mentioned uh, a couple of hours ago, I think not quite a, a best practices, um, but certainly looking at the recommendation towards, um, yeah, asking, asking to create a guide for local governments that establishes legislative authorities that there is a consensus exists. Um, so sort of to, to answer the question of like, well, if we're, if we're not going to reach consensus on what legislative authorizations um, need to be addressed right now, um, creating a consensus document that localities, and, and Mike, I'd ask you to weigh in, like creating a consensus document that localities could look at. Like a um, technical assistance guidance or something like some kind Yeah, of uh, so that way we're all working off the same playbook. And then if you have a purchasing agent that says, I don't think you can do that, if you have to point to something and say, well, the state says I can. Okay. I'm not going to commit to shell that thing without her saying so. <laughs> She's idea. not here. You know, all mine. Shell, you've been calling all <laughs> I didn't hear anything at all. Don't worry. <laughs> you got a new assignment. It's not true, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> We, well, barring none, again, we kind of went over the timeline. If you all can go back to your groups and say, kind of get back to us on or around August 5th, we said was yeah. like that yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great because then we can go and write the actual. Is there any further we have to go in? That was our public comment. Yes. To meet our criteria as a public body of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, it was an opportunity for public comment. Um, anybody online uh, that would like to provide public comment towards the body? Hearing none, uh, what's the next slide? Anyone in the room? I just have one public comment. Anyone in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I will have one public comment. And maybe I should consult with staff first, but I do wonder out of all the areas that we've kind of covered today in terms of development, you know, be it residential or a little bit of commercial, I wonder if it would ever be helpful to have a joint broadband advisory council and Virginia Housing Commission meeting so that the two entities are talking together on what their efforts are doing. Because I do know that in the last Housing Commission meeting, you know, the chair, Danny Marshall, did bring up broadband and are we getting to the unserved areas of the Commonwealth? And so I just wonder if that was something, you know, that could ever be coordinated uh, or maybe it's just a DHCB broadband team presentation to Housing Commission and vice versa. It might just help everybody kind of connect the dots and, and um, you know, sync up where we need to. No, I appreciate that. It was ironic. We were in Southwest Virginia when we found out there was a housing commission meeting. So Brian, who, who would have gone, was actually, we were in Southwest Virginia doing housing listening sessions. <laughs> and so the irony. And so, no, I think that that's a great point. Because now that they think they're now meeting again, I don't mm -hmm. think they've had right. places to right. their meeting. So it's like they're starting to meet again. So we will take that, we will take that comment. Yep. So with that, some next steps, 
we outlined. Um, give us your feedback from the groups by August 5th. Um, we'll draft the report over 20 days following that, send it out on August 25th, which is one week before our uh, stakeholder advisory group meeting. I'm, I'm sensing that there's also going to be, be the need to send that out to your groups after, after that. with that. Um, we probably we would want a quicker turnaround on that one, uh, probably around a week or so, so we could write the final report, present it to the Broadband Advisory Council. For the can you update this slide and send the slide out to us? Yeah, we can do that. And so just so you know, the advisory council is on target for meeting before September 30th. Like the last two, I heard that from Senator Boyce go up for availability. Week up, yeah. The week up. Yeah. So good deal. Well, thanks for the time. Thank thanks for the community. For those online, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. Yeah.